right, everybody. Thank you for uh, turning up. I appreciate that. Uh, I will open the. I declare the Hamilton City Council Finance Committee meeting for Tuesday, the third of April, two thousand and eighteen, to be open. I have one apology from Councillor O'Leary. I'll move. Okay. Uh, so we've got. Uh, I, I just saw Martin walk in a second ago. Okay, all right. Uh, so I'll, uh, Councillor O'Leary for absence, uh, Councillor, uh, Deputy Mayor um, Gallagher for lateness. So that was Mallet and Casson. Those in favour, those against, carried. Thank you. I uh, just want to confirm the agenda. We have a, a plethora of paper up here. Uh, we have a number of um, visitors today. We have some late reports and we have some pages missing out of your uh, agenda. So the first one I'll go to is there is a page which I think has been, it's a, I think this is called A3 size. There's an A3 size page which was page 101. However, it was left out during the printing process, so there is now a new page 101. So this page goes in after page 100, but we'll call it page 100A. If that helps, that's one bit of the paper out of the way. Um, we have a late report, which is the report on the structure of the uh, CCOs regarding New Zealand Food Innovation Waikato. Um, what's my trumped up reason? Okay, the reason it's late is timing. Good, well done. Okay, we'll accept, add that to the uh, thing. I can't believe that got through. <laughs> okay. Um, and as I said, I, we will need to be flexible. We, we have a number of um, submitters to a uh, number of uh, speakers from our CCOs, so that, some of them from out of town, so councillors, if we can be a little bit flexible to try and fit around uh, their agendas as well. Um, Okay, having said all that, I will confirm the agenda. Mallet, Casson, those in favour, those against, carried. Thank you. Do we have any declarations of interest? No declarations of interest, thank you. I see we have no one in the public forum. We'll now move on to item five, confirmation of the Finance Committee meeting, open minutes, 22 February, page six in your agendas. Are there any questions? Any queries? All right, I'll move those be received as a true and fair view. Rep uh, record. Uh, Mallet, Casson, those in favour, those against, carried. Thank you. Um, we have no presenters here, so I'll go straight to the Chair's report, item 6, page 13. I'll take it as read and ask for questions, queries, challenges. Do I have to have discussion on here so I can see the names? Eh? Yeah. Okay, Rob, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I have got a number of questions. I, I, don't, I don't regard them as challenges, but um, let's just see how they go anyway. First question is, um, is in the first paragraph about confusion. Um, you suggest um, that at least one councillor is confused and or disagrees with the balancing book <coughs> measure. Um, will you name those councillors? Happy to. Yep. Uh, the councillor I'm aware of is Councillor O'Leary, who in her Facebook page of February the 26th, nine, uh, 2018, clearly uh, disagreed with the balancing the books figure and claimed that we should only be using the uh, the accounting figure or the, uh, what is it called, the, comp uh, the statement of comprehension revenue and um, expenses, expenses. So I have that here if anyone wants it. So who are the others, Chair? Can you oh, say at least one? Um, and, and my concern, uh, and the I'm reason not, I'm, I'm asking that question, I think, most of us were aware of the one that you've referred to, mm -hmm. but um, most of us have Facebook pages, and I guess we're implicated, all implicated, if we haven't perhaps been named as... Oh, well, I've named it, so you're OK on that one now. 
The question in the last one as to which one we follow, so I'm quite confused. Uh, you know, not disagreeing with any of them, but it's constant explanation is useful to me as well. So thank so you for your confusion, Mark. Okay. So, you, <laughs> so you've got this on your Facebook page too? No, 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 no. No, but okay. I'm constantly okay. right. asking questions. About I guess I'm, I'm just uh, concerned that by implication, um, when you've got at least one councillor, mm. there are presumably others. And uh, unless all. they are named, then it suggests that any one of us um, might be um, implicated or guilty of whatever crime might have been committed. OK, on that matter, are you now comfortable that I've said it's Angela O'Leary and I think Mark has also said he is a little confused or unsure? But has he put it on his Facebook page? Oh, I have no idea. Absolutely no idea. OK, all right. Well, So, so you think there's only one rather than... At, at least well, one. It, well, I'm accurate. At least one, which means at, le at least but, one. Yeah, and, but at yep. least one means more than one. If, well, if you want to be uh, pedantic, uh, I think we've just heard that Mark has um, expressed some degree of confusion, so we've got to two. I don't think this line of query is, uh, is actually adding anything to what anyone knows about this. OK, I, well, I guess I'm just looking to find out who those people were, just to make sure that if I was one of them, then perhaps I had an opportunity to, to defend myself. Um, but clearly, um, the way that the report's written is quite confusing to me in the sense that it suggests well, that there another were, that more than one. You've just proved, well, you've just proved confused, confused about the report anyway. OK. OK. Uh, all right. Well, let, uh, let's just move on. I guess, I guess it's perhaps just the way the report's written that... Um, that I've taken a little bit of an exception to. Um, when you do the longer explanation of the uh, balancing books measure, which starts on 14 and goes to 15, um, you refer to the calculation um, which shows a deficit on page 15 of 3715, mm -hmm. and that when you add that together with the surplus, you end up with... Um, um, 26.356 million, and you're indicating that this is uh, re less revenue that council has to meet with day-to-day -day expenses. Are you suggesting in that particular paragraph below that calculation that um, the operating loss has now increased to 26.356 million? No, I'm saying the operating revenue the revenue that we have available to us to meet our day-to-day -day expenses is $26 million less than as reported if you only looked at the statement of, whatever it's called, the comprehensive statement of revenue and expenses. We'll call it, can we call it the accounting report? The accounting report. OK, so, so you're not suggesting that the loss is now $26 million, uh, in the sense that we are, are... I was quite clear in what I said, no. All right. Well, it, it certainly suggests that it All could be... All the way through could, here, Rob, I have it, talked about council's day-to-day -day operating expenses. Yes, yes. Yep. But, yeah, but if you took the $26 million, uh, and took out the deficit, which is $3 million, the, the remaining $22 million is presumably available to meet... Um, uh, is a surplus that's available to meet um, uh, outgoing such as loan repayments and so forth. Not at all. Which is what it's actually doing. Not at doing. all. That $22 million includes right. development contributions, vested assets, pipes, roads, parks. Do you honestly think... That, see, this is concerning to me that your question suggests you don't understand it either because that no, 22... I I hang on, yeah, hang on. That uh, $22 million, you're asking a question. That $22 million is not cash. It is not all available to pay wages, to pay the power bills, to pay any of our day-to-day -day operating expenses, a significant amount of it is made up of things that simply cannot be used for that. That, that $22 million, though, is after deducting the wages and the power and all of the operating costs. That's the net... Uh, that's the... That, that's the net of our... That's the net of expenses being deducted from revenue. I, well, I, look, look I, I, I just find the statement there confusing that it suggests if that, if that particular statement is read following the calculation that we have a $26 million loss 
which isn't correct. No, sorry, Rob. Um, right, well, we'll, if, we'll, if, you, we'll, if you go back, look, that, look, that, we'll, that all comes we'll from... Beg, I'm, I'm, we'll beg to disagree on this, uh, Chair. But, well, not to um, disagree. I, mean, I think, again, is... it's the way that the report's been written is, is in my view, adds to uh, confusing um, uh, not only elected members but also the general public who might read this, that this is more serious than what we have previously been led to believe. And so I... So are you challenging the fact, or are you challenging the, my position that, and and the and you've even voted for this, the majority of this um, council's decision that some degree of uh, alteration needs to be made to our statement of financial, our accounting report, uh, no. that 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 adjustment is as a consequence of a number of very very material revenue streams that are simply not available. To pay our day-to-day -day expenses, and those, and I've done a. Uh, the report clearly identifies why what they ide identifies those and explains why you can't use them to pay wages and power bills and petrol bills and things like that. So, are you clear? Are you suggesting that it is wrong that we report that? No, I'm not questioning having a balancing of the books measure. I'm simply questioning what's in this report where you've added together the surplus and the deficit and then said that we have got less revenue available to meet Council's day-to-day -day operating expenses. And I just believe that that statement is incorrect. But quite clearly, we will beg to differ on that. Um, and um, I'm just a little concerned that anyone reading that, whether they're around this table or reading it in the public, will similarly be confused by the fact that um, there's a suggestion, a strong suggestion in that, um, in that statement. That Which statement are you referring I'm to? I'm referring to the statement that is immediately below the calculation. Absent where these three you say items. That's 26 million less revenue available to meet Council's day to day operating expenses. Do you not agree that that $26 million? Um, that revenue, the, the, the revenue that makes up that $26 million is not available to meet day-to-day, -day, council's day-to-day -day operating expenses, i.e. do you think that that but $26 million of revenue is available to meet no, council's day-to-day? No, no, day -to -day? we've already met our day-to-day -day living expenses and arriving at the $22 million because we've already deducted in order to arrive at the $22 million things like the wages, the power, the operating costs of the city. Yeah, and how, have we, how where did the cash come from to pay all those operating expenses? From the rates. You're joking. Oh, well, you, I, 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 OK, you, right. look, look, uh, um, Chair, we're not, no, we're not, you've got this we're not going wrong, to, Rob. we're not going to agree on this, but quite clearly my argument is, is that that statement is, is patently incorrect and adds to the confusion that I think you are trying to um, counter by having produced this statement in the first place. I'm sorry, I cannot agree that that okay. statement is incorrect. All right, let's move on, because I think that um, uh, we will beg to differ on that. OK. All right. Um, um, just the comment on your Star Trek quote. Um, is it, is it fair to say over time capital receipts, vested assets except for land and development contributions eventually morph into day-to-day -day revenue and expenditure? Uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, none of those, uh, a road or, or, a, or, or, or a pipe or a contribution that is tagged to the gardens or a New Zealand transport um, NZTA uh, subsidy never become revenue available to pay day-to-day -day expenses. You cannot pay your staff member with a shovel load of dirt from a park that has been vested to the city. No, I'm, not the I'm not saying that they, that they become revenue, but they become an expense on which we collect revenue to meet the cost. No, none of those things generate a revenue. 
None of them generated, or, uh, no. virtually none of them generated we, revenue. Unlike a business, when it buy, uh, invests in assets, it does that because it assumes the assets will generate an, 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 a revenue which will pay themselves back. Roads, parks, stormwater plants, stormwater um, piping, uh, uh, irrigation, all of that stuff, none of it gener generates revenue. Our revenue is primarily driven by the rates we collect off our residents. I think you might have answered my question in the sense of saying, what I'm saying is that, is it fair to say that capital receipts, vested assets except for land, and DCs eventually morph into day-to-day -day revenue and expenditure? And they do. Now, hang on, hang on. They, you, said, you said morph into day-to-day -day revenue. And What's that? And expenditure. No, no, do you, no, you said day-to-day oh, -day revenue. OK, I, I was sure I said revenue because I read it from the statement here. I said revenue and expenditure. So at, when, when, at what stage did development contributions, vested assets and capital revenue morph into day-to-day -day revenue? Well, they do because we, we, they become, eventually become revenue costs. You the, cost of, the cost black. of vested assets eventually become a, a, an expenditure in our accounts whether it's, a, it's an operating expenditure or it's a depreciation cost. Say that again. Um, yes, uh, what I said is that um, vested assets, except for land, mm -hmm. uh, eventually become a cost in our revenue statement. Correct. Yep. So therefore we collect the revenue to cover those costs. Those assets don't drive the revenue. We simply start rating our uh -huh. ratepayers more. That's right. You can shake your head as yeah. much as you yeah. like, but that's yeah. right, yeah. yeah. Or, or we have receipts that come in that, ha that, that go towards the cost of those, and some of those will be DCs and some of them will be capital receipts. No, no. There'll be bits of land. There'll be pipes. No, I, I excluded land from my. Okay, discussion. sorry. There'll be roads. There'll be pipes. There'll be yep. footpaths. Yep. Yep. There'll be parks. Yep. And we will charge for those in our rates. Yeah, those assets don't generate any revenue, though. Yes, they do. No, they, they don't. Do they generate rates. We we oh. we generate. Well, I, okay. Yeah, and, I and think I think we. I mean, I th the, the I law is quite uh, clear Gary, on this. I think we, rates are a tax. Okay, this has been through many court cases and whatnot. Rates are a tax. They are not a revenue from these assets. In fact, these assets, as you've, you've eloquently expressed, generate no income. In fact, all they do is generate cost. Okay, I beg to differ on that, but let's, let's move on because I don't think we'll, we will in this forum, mm -hmm. um, um, uh, um, um, we will in this forum answer that. Um, council spending problems, which you cover further down. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that, uh, in terms of the statement that, <clears throat> in terms of the statement that you've made there, do you think that by uh, reducing expenditure, we could um, um, we could uh, eliminate the need for a rate increase? Of course we could. Whether or not that would be acceptable, A, to the members of this committee, of this, uh, of this bo uh, body, or our residents, I don't know. But we certainly could, yes? We could? Yeah. Yeah, OK. So do you have some practical ideas? I I've mean, had numbers of ideas. Well, <laughs> I've, well, I've tried some to, practical I've tried, ideas I'll, I'll on how we might I'll achieve that. I'll give you half that. a dozen. I'll give you a few now. I think we're spending way too... Oh. Actually, okay. Well, I'm going to read. If you want to relitigate the whole 10-year plan, but I've tried to uh, tried to get council to address our issues with Claudelands. I've tried to get council yeah. to address no, our I, issues. I, you, you asked a yeah, question. Yeah, I'm okay. trying to get uh, uh, council to read, uh, have a look at our con uh, situation with the CBD library. I've, I've talked about too much expenditure on um, uh, bike uh, ways and things like that. Uh, these, and these are millions of dollars per year in expenses, which there are, I agree, there are total, there are differences around this table about whether they should be there, whether they, they provide an adequate value for money to the rate par, and we've all got, and uh, thus far, I've lost those, um, but I certainly have been bringing those things up for the last four years. So, so I mean, I asked for practical solutions, and clearly, 
um, whilst there are a number around the table who might support your view on Claudelands, um, it's not a simple answer to, um, as to how we might reduce the cost of Claudelands. And, and I was asking for practical... That's your opinion. OK. All right. Again, I've... Uh, again, Clearly not mine. There's a difference in terms of finding practical outcomes um, uh, around, around that expenditure. Well, that, that's your description of it. Okay. I, I would suggest it's no different than what we've been, been going through with Waikato Innovation Park and a number of other assets which we've sold off. If we sell the Claudens Event Centre, it's, not, it's still going to be there. It just won't, the costs won't be falling on the ratepayer. It'll be someone else who's perhaps a more uh, competent operator will be operating the thing. Mm. Directed, rather than getting into a debate back and forward between two quite different ways of seeing what's going on. Do you understand what you said? <laughs> Bob, is, Bob is raising um, questions, which yep. he's legitimately entitled yep. to ask, and you're debating with him. Having said that, there are. I'm answering the questions. Good. Yes, you're debating with him, and I'd like to also hear from staff if there is any um, substance to any of those matters that he's raising. I think it's um, appropriate in question time that they'd be given the opportunity to speak to that. OK, Rob, you... Yeah, just, just, just some final questions on the spending issue. Um, um, and one of the areas that you didn't cover in your report was whether or not uh, Council was collecting enough rate revenue. And uh, we have been... Um, um, we have been... We've, we've been given evidence during the 10-year plan debate uh, during the 10-year plan deliberations, that our rates are significantly lower than other metro cities. And you haven't covered in your report um, whether um, you, f you believe that... You you've covered the, the spending issue or your personal view on the spending issue, but you haven't covered off what your view is on whether or not our rates are sufficiently... Are sufficient to cover the cost of running the city when we compare our, the cost, our, our running costs with other similar sized cities in New Zealand? It's a totally circular question, of course. Um, if our expenses are too high, our rates will have to go up. If our expenses are not too high, our rates won't have to go up. It's as simple as that. I've, um, you've asked me about how I would suggest we could get our rates, our expenditure down. I've given you two or three. And throughout the last four and a half years on council, I've, I've issued an, a litany of um, efforts to try and reduce council spending. So, um, yeah, so as I said, that's a circular question. If, if, if the majority of this council wants to continue spending the way we are, our rates will have to go up, or our borrowing will have to go up until such time as we're not allowed to borrow anymore. If, I won't use the word sanity, because that's un, uh, unfair to a lot of people, but um, if, if we had a council that were thinking more the way I am, we would be reach, we would be addressing this by reducing expenditure. As I said, it's a circular question. In the uh, in the last part of your paper, you uh, seem to have revised uh, what you've got on page 15 um, of the $22 million surplus, which has increased to $41 million. Um, so are you on page 17 now, right? I'm on page 17, you're right yep. at the yep. end of your report. Um, just applying the discussion that we had around the 26 million, that is adding the two together, do you now think that we're in a much more serious position uh, than we were when you wrote the first part of the report with a $22 million surplus, that we now have a $42 million difference to yeah. the $26 yeah. million dollar difference that was The gap between the two um, uh, uh, disclosures, the uh, accounting disclosure and the uh, balancing the book disclosure, and that's the LGN, uh, not our 10-year um, plan one, uh, is become massive to the extent now that um, our, if you rely on the accounting reporting, you would be a million. Well, you'll be 50, you'll be 24 million, uh, 42 million dollars out on being able to meet our everyday expenses with our everyday revenue. So you're saying that the $26 million deficit now 
has risen to $42 million. Correct. In the space by using of the balancing two, two or the three months. Sorry, beg your pardon? In the space of two or three months. Yeah, yeah it has. Okay, and you've used... By using the local government balancing... You've used different budget. measures here, haven't you? Well, yeah, uh, through, through this report, I'd primarily use the recommended... And I've made that quite clear through the report. Use the, the balancing the book um, measure that we have recommended for our 10-year plan. So what I'm trying to do is get some sort of handle on uh, councils to understand what, what thus far, that is council's position at the moment. That may change after the consultation. I don't know that it will. But um, anyway, and we've got lots of reports from PwC and things like that, that, that um, balancing the uh, books uh, measure is fit for purpose. So there's so, two, and the other one here, the, I've just gone to just exactly what's in the um, accounts. So the two measures are quite different, aren't they? That you've uh, used the LG they are different. and Z well, one. Well, as, as you'll know, Rob, there's three measures. There's one which we're currently using, which was started in Julie Hardacre's first term. There's a local government New Zealand one, which we are required to report, but which has had little visibility for a long time. And I think that's where Andrew um, identified it uh, uh, sort of early on in his uh, uh, mer meralty. Uh, and then we've had, of course, the uh, WPC, PWC re uh, uh, report, which is the one we have recommended to go out to use for the next 10-year plan. Thank you. So, so there, yeah, the reality is there are three balancing the books reports we're using now, which is confusing. With the Chair, do you, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to just make sure that I can um, um, offer some offer some uh, value value to this conversation. I've been quietly listening to the debate and and respecting that debate. But I just want to be very clear um, from my perspective on reading this report. It's all about understanding and trying to clarify balancing the books and how we live within our means. The Gary is trying to identify revenue that is used for building assets and therefore pre-tagged and therefore not, um, not available to be spent on everyday costs. So this is about clarifying our balance the books measure so that we can more transparently see whether we're living within our means as a city. Um, in terms of the local government measure, that's, that, that's a, um, a, a different measure and one that we will always track, but we will if the proposed 10-year plan new measure comes through in terms of the long-term plan, adopt uh, a new measure, so we'll have two measures to report. One which we are bound to do through legislation, which is the um, balance books benchmark um, per, per the local government, and one which is our, <coughs> our review, revised balance the books measure that more accurately reflects the revenue we get from ratepayers, fees and charges, that should be used, <coughs> excuse me, to um, to offset everyday costs. So what we're trying to do is create clarity with the 10-year plan and the new measure, not more ambiguity. So my comments are really just to come on the back of that discussion and make sure that everyone is fully aware that, um, as we've discussed in the long-term plan or the 10-year plan process, we've said that development contributions skew the reality in the sense that those, those development contributions is cash we receive from developers to repay debt. Um, repay debt for assets that we've put in the ground to enable growth. So, or or they're, at, at some times they're in advance, but majority is, majority is um, we've already spent the money, we've loaned the money, and the, D, the DCs that come in is cash that we re repay debt. Um, if we have a look at the difference, the Gary's trying to show the movement between <laughs> Our total accounting result, which is measured in the Statement of Comprehensive Revenue and um, Expenses, and is trying to say, well, if we pull out all that capital-based revenue that's tagged for building assets, we're, we're left with, on page 15, it was a $3.7 million deficit, which is a calculation that Gary's done, uh, um, just by pulling those three items out. On page 17, when we have a look at the difference being $42 million, what that is showing is that, not that we're in a more serious situation, because as you can see per the local government measure, we're at a deficit of 1.2 million. Um, we're saying that our DCs and our vested assets are increasing. And so the, the, the size going from 26 million, based on the December accounts, through to the size of that gap in the February accounts, is related to the size of the DCs and the vested assets that are coming through our books. What's not in this report 
And if we were to have a look at what we're proposing as a measure for the, for the next 10-year uh, plan, if we took our February numbers, we would be showing a small surplus of 1.1 million as at the end of February. So I, I don't want any misinformation in the sense of things are worsening. We are, we are showing a surplus of 1.1 million under our new measure that we are proposing for the 10-year plan. Hopefully those comments are helpful. You I'll finish. Thank, okay, thank thanks, you. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Jeff. Thank you, uh, Gary, and thanks for the report. The, um, I mean, obviously, it's uh, b before we adopted the uh, the balancing the books measure. It was a historical approach that the council had uh, incorporated the DCs as, as part of their revenue, as part of their accounting system. I'm just. I'm just interested in, in, was there much debate about this particular issue in the last term, or is, has it just sort of landed as some sort of epiphany this, at the start of this term? Because uh, it's obviously been out there that the DCs have been playing a major role for years now. Was this discussed in the last council term? Uh, yes, um, every meeting had uh, reported to us the, balance, the accounting result yeah, indeed. and the councils um, balancing the books result. Uh, I think in the back of the um, Finance Committee meeting, there were, we also used to report the LGN one, didn't we? Or was that only in the annual report we reported that, Andrew? Yeah, so we, yeah, Council wasn't getting the local government balancing the books report ev in every Finance Committee meeting. It was only being reported as it was required to be reported in our annual report, so once a year. So it's obviously, uh, as the general manager has said, it's, it's regarded as important that we differentiate that income from DCs as opposed to other revenue. Was it not regarded as important in the last term to do that? DCs were obviously a significant uh, factor in yep. the last term. Was it not regarded as important then, but suddenly it is now? Um, it was being reported. Uh, well, okay. The council's pre the council's current balancing the books um, uh, disclosure to pulls out what DCs. pulls out DCs. So that that was pulling out DCs. Did it? What did it do to vested assets? And it didn't. Well, there was no move to adopt a balance the books measure last term. Pardon. Well, can you tell me a bit more about that then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just trying to find the balancing the books measure. That had been adopted in 2012, and that was the same, um, uh, the same um, basis that was adopted in 2012. In between 2012 and 2015, what was known as the local government measure was first yep. um, put into the marketplace, I guess. And I remember a discussion in 2015 uh, as to whether or not we regarded the local government New Zealand method better than the one that this council had adopted in 2012. So there was discussion around whether or not in 2015 the method would change. And, um, and the outcome of that discussion was, and the outcome of that discussion and the and the agreement around the council table then was that we would continue with the same uh, balancing the books measure as the council had adopted in 2012, and that's the one that we are currently using now. Um, also, just a comment that in that la in the last term, certainly at the beginning of the last term the amount of DCs being collected was significantly less than what's being collected now. Um, um, and that sort of, the level of DCs being collected has gone up quite significantly in the last, I guess, I'm guessing here, because I haven't got the figures in front of me, but certainly in the last three years, it's gone up, it's gone up quite significantly. And of course, the vesting of land is, is, a, is a byproduct of DCs, because if there are lots of DCs being paid, then there's obviously a lot of new streets and, um, and um, you know, being created in greenfield sites, which leads to an increasing value of vested assets. Okay. So the existing 
Council balancing the books uh, measure does not pull out development contributions. It pulls out vested assets, which is um, yep. you know, roads yep. and pipes yep. that developers that. do for us. Okay. Thank you. On, yeah. on that subject? Yep. Yeah, it was very, very clearly pointed out to the last senior leadership that central government required us to report one way and we were requiring another way, which was tens of millions of dollars difference to and masked the balancing of our books. And from that conversation, the last 10 year plan actually got um, leading up to the Christmas actually got voted down and um, over Christmas stuff had to go away and relook at things. And um, the, there was a very clear understanding from certain members around this table that they weren't comfortable with DCs being bought in as revenue. Ryan, thanks, Andrew. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I guess just to take a leaf out of your book, you know how you're quite partial to the year being stipulated after yeah. you know, financial. Yeah. yeah. I, I think going forward, with we see this BB coming up, and I appreciate in your report you've actually in that you know 14, 15, you're saying this is the Hamilton City Council adopted. Yeah. BB, I, I reckon it's going to be prudent to get that tagged every time we see it because obviously it's that BB on 15 is HCCs and then it fluctuates back to the LGNZ BB which you've got identified but um, I think it's going to be really clear going forward that that's highlighted because obviously the difference is significant. Just to clarify too and this might be a question for um, David. Um, So the main difference between the LGNZ BB and our BB is to eliminate any gains or losses from interest rate, rate swaps, revenue associated with vested assets and the capital subsidy for the ring road. Um, that 65-35 split of DCs, is that also an, uh, our model or was that the LGNZ one? No, that's our model. Um, so, in the monitoring report, you're seeing the 2015 balance in the books measure and the local government measure, um, so that you can have both of those measures. Um, the confusing thing here is that we're just going into long-term plan discussions where we're revising our 2015 measure to take out 35% of DCs, such that um, we we acknowledge, um, so, uh, sorry, take out 65% of development contributions from a balance in the book measure, not um, and, and put back 35% to cover off the interest, yep. as well as removing all of the vested assets and all of capital subsidies. So we're really um, going to, down to detail in terms of anything, the nature of the revenue that we receive and the purpose of that revenue, if it's tagged to build assets, it's yep. no longer part of the yep. um, no, balancing the box count. I just wanted that little <coughs> bit of clarification. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Uh, Mark. And, um, thanks for the hearty debate. It's really helped with my confusion. I'm much clearer now. Hey, um, I'm joking. Uh, the, Smoke and mirrors everywhere. This, um, the, but our measure, like our PWC measure, which seems to be the measure we're going to go on Just with. Just be careful. That's the one we've recommended to use yes. in our 10-year plan, but we yes. don't use yet. But I have used it sometimes in my report. Yep, yep, yep. of course. Um, that's, that's obviously unique to this council. Have you got any idea, and David, you might be able to answer it better, um, what other councils are using um, as their measure? Are they using the LGNZ measure, their own balancing the books measures, in particular the growth councils, your Auckland and Tarongas? Um, a number of councils are using the local government measure as their standard. Um, Just to be clear, sorry, they all have to use that yes, yeah, they are. Yeah, at the end report. of the year. And a number but of councils haven't developed um, other alternate measures, and they're just using that local government measure. Um, the 35 per cent that, that it's unique to Hamilton City Council. I'm not aware of what Auckland are using, but I can um, go and do some research on that in terms of the growth councils and have a look at what they are using, but they, um, they should be following the same methodology as what we're doing in terms of, it's not that we're coming up with a nice, unique measure that satisfies us. We're really mm, looking mm. at the substance of the transactions. Um, yeah. the, of course, the 35-65 split is unique to Hamilton, and they, yep. there may be a different split at other councils. Yeah, of course. Right. Just it'll be quite useful for me because we're often getting compared with other uh, councils' rate levels, and etc. And it's quite an uh, important part of our, you know, argument, if you like. Yeah. So it'll be quite nice to be able to see what the closest measure to ours would be in a similar situation. Yep, I'll, um, Thanks. I'll do some research. You yeah, don't dig too deep, but it'll be quite candid. <laughs> okay, good. 
Um, so, do we all agree there is some confusion about this? Yeah. <laughs> and has the report or the debate <laughs> helped? Okay. All right. Um, no more questions. Oh, sorry, Martin. Statement, comment. We're in I questions mean, at the moment. We okay. Well, I, I guess it would be is the intent to the general managers and the intent, intention to have ongoing discussions with our comms team uh, to ensure that every opportunity we uh, underscore the, the issues and the debates of today, particularly in terms of change, changing criteria. Yes. Because obviously what the general public will say, well, wait a minute, you said, obviously I'm repeating what's been said, you said one thing two years ago, now you're saying something else, and I think it's really crucial that that is explained. Sure, and um, you know we feel we've done a pretty good job in the consultation document that's gone out, but we're going to use every endeavour we can to continue to repeat that Would message. it be your intention, is, while we still have a print version of the city news before it disappears into some digital thing, um, that possibly that could also be used for a brief bullet point explanation as well? Absolutely. Thank you. So, James, have you, you want to, got a question, have it? Question, yep, sure. yeah, just a brief question. Um, so, yeah, there is a little bit of confusion, I think, because 2016, running up to the uh, 2016 elections, um, we were told, and uh, all the new councillors coming in, anybody running was told that uh, the council coffers were in good stead and um, that everything was running on tickety boo. Some people even ran, and, and I think it was uh, you, Rob, that uh, safe hand on the wheel because the, the council coffers were in good stead. All of a sudden, when we come into council, the coffers are not in good stead. So why has this been masked for so long? Have, have we known about the DCs for, for a very long time that they shouldn't be included, but it just hasn't been made public because everybody's been fooled by this? I'll take a punt. I don't... I wasn't... You know, I was on the council, but I'm not... I wasn't privy to those sort of... I think the, the view was that um, we have got a balancing the books measure that is fit for purpose at the moment. I think perhaps we're a bit late to the... Um, late to the party in terms of identifying the significant growth in some of these things. Um, yeah, and, and that, I think it just underscores the importance of us, because the, at the moment we are uh, recommending a different balancing the books measure for our 10-year plan. We need to review that all the way through too, because sources of revenue will change through the 10-year plan plan, you know, maybe if um, petrol taxes come in, that might be deemed to be a tagged revenue, because you know, presumably tax, petrol tax would be tagged to roads, I'm not sure. And, and, there, and there's some debate to go around that. I, I, I could be wrong in my, my thinking. But maybe petrol tax also comes out of our rates and, well, comes out of our everyday revenue and goes into a bucket or a, what do they call them, um, jam jar to be used for road maintenance and things like that. So this is a, an evolving thing, and I think perhaps the last term we may have just simply not quite reviewed uh, whether our uh, balancing, the books, uh, uh, balancing the books measure was fit for purpose. So things changed. Mm. So I'm not sure if I answered the question or not. But no, not really. <laughs> if I can just add some comments to mm. the Chair. The, I mean, the nature of the development contributions has not changed over the last little while. So. You're entirely correct to point out that um, the, our previous balancing the books measure, when we look going forward from today, um, requires some refinement. Um, um, nevertheless, the, the development contributions numbers were always fully reported in the Statement of Comprehensive Revenue and, and Expenses. Um, so there's been nothing hidden um, with regard to that number and the vested number that's climbed through the last triennium, what we became greatly aware of is that the size of those numbers were getting to a point where our balance in the books measure needed to be adjusted. Mm. Yeah, well, it was certainly a surprise for us new councillors, and it's, it must be, if it was a surprise for us, it must be a surprise for the public, the ratepayer as well. So I think council had to be very transparent on, on what they're doing and what they're including it, et cetera. And so I think this new measure is going to be a significant improvement. OK, there's no more discussion. I'll um, begin the debate. Does anyone have any? Okay, I'll move. Okay, we'll that the, the report, report be be received. Okay, because that's not in the report. Okay. Yep, that the report be received. I think is all we're doing. Yep. Um, and, and I just very briefly, uh, and James highlighted then, and, and David responded. Um, the last council 
and I'm not blaming anyone, um, clearly considered developed, well, treated uh, development contributions as if they were available to be used for day-to-day -day payment of day-to-day -day costs. That was not the case. Um, our process we went through when Andrew came through with the PwC um, analysis now treats um, development contributions as not available for covering day-to-day -day costs and some other um, of our revenue streams. All we're trying to do at the moment um, is get clarity for our going forward in our 10-year plan. All I was trying to do was to bring some clarity to the table and, and ironically, halfway through doing this report, the February figures turned up and it was a massive change between the, the accounting disclosure and the balancing the book disclosure. So that now that added a little bit of complexity to the report, I guess, So because you, you're dealing with a whole lot of other... I tried to um, identify clearly what I was talking uh, to when I went through. Anyway, uh, all we're doing is receiving the report. Uh, Mallet King, those in favour... Oh, I beg your pardon, there is some debate. Sorry, yep. Thanks, Chair. Look, I just want to make a couple of comments. I can assure Council that there was no masking of figures in the last term. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, at the beginning of the term, the DCs were not a significant amount, certainly nowhere near what they are now. And in our annual report, we did report both the LGNZ uh, balancing the books figure and the Council's approved balancing the books measure. So there was clear... Uh, there, there, there was clear disclosure of uh, the, two, the two particular balances, and it was pretty easy to do and calculate what the difference was. Um, it's pleasing to hear this morning um, uh, from uh, management that the uh, PWC method, which of course is not one that we're currently measuring on, is showing a 1.1 surplus when uh, throughout this term we've been told that the PWC measure uh, would be showing um, an $8 million hole that increased to $11.5 million, that went up to $16 million, um, that appears today to be maybe as high as $26 or $42 million. Um, and I appreciate the $1.1 million is just a snapshot of the current time for, for an eight-month period. But it's suggesting to me that um, we may not have um, these huge deficits um, uh, following us as, as, as was previously predicted. And look, I think um, we're going to go through a period, as, as night follows day, um, we go through recessionary periods and there will be times when our DCs will drop significantly, not because we're, we're doing a poor job of collecting them, but simply because there will be fewer new sections coming onto the market. And so the DC uh, revenue stream, and I think if you go back to 2008, 2007, 2008, this council budgeted for significant DCs and found that they collected very little of it because that was the start of the GFC. Um, so, look, I, 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 I agree that I think this new method, this new um, um, uh, measure is, is a useful one, but it's one that we're going to have to monitor pretty closely because it's by no means a silver bullet that will carry us through all the different changes that will happen both in terms of a growing city and a city that might not grow as fast as we believe simply because of external uh, factors that we have limited control on. Look, I think the Chair's made a valiant and I think honest effort uh, attempt today to explain where those differences, is, differences are and where some confusion might be. Um, sadly, I don't think the confusion um, um, is, is, has necessarily been totally released, but we need to have uh, reports like this, and if it seems like I've uh, tried to attack um, the, um, the, the, the report, that certainly is not my intent. I had um, read it on the basis that it might have improved also some of the thoughts that I have on this, and, and to be fair, some of the definitions and so forth are extremely helpful, and I commend the Chair on that. But I think that there is still significant con con 
uh, confu confusion out there, even amongst us, let alone how that confusion is being picked up by, um, by the general public. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Andrew. Uh, firstly, I just don't think it's appropriate to draw out names of elected members, particularly when they're not here to defend themselves. I think that's bad taste. Yeah, you're allowed to do it, but I just don't think it's the way that actually drawing out names around this table um, is, is not what I like to see, and it makes me feel uncomfortable. Um, there is no confusion. This table unanimously voted for a new balancing the books measure. And we all agreed on that. Two members weren't here, but it was an unanimous decision. So this um, only confusion is introduced confusion. We know what measure we're using going forward in a 10 year plan, the draft 10 year plan that's out there. And that's a measure that everyone around this table voted on and accepted. And I also just want to make it really clear that the council, this council, which is happening right now with the 10 year plan, we set the financial measure. The chief executive's job is to administer that measure and, and with his staff. And the chief executive did, did sound a warning bell several times in the last triennium. It wasn't something that was just dumped on us here at the beginning of this triennium. And I want to make it really clear, like I consistently have, is that DCs came in very quickly and very fast. And uh, with, the, with the change from a lot of sections sitting out there that were unsold and then the GFC came to an end and those sections started selling and the, and the old measure was already in place. And to pick up halfway through a term and, and look at the measure that you've got and change it halfway through the term would take a lot of reflection and it would be very difficult to actually do that because in a way it would say that what we'd set the first time around wasn't correct. But things did move very, very quickly and it's possible that during one of the annual plans we should have picked up then and, and, had a, and reset the measure. And, and, and I just want to finish by saying that I've consistently said there's nothing to be achieved by looking back and blaming others. This is about picking up what we've got during this term, which this council is doing, setting the measure that's appropriate for this three-year term, for this three-year part of the 10-year plan, and, and, and looking forward. Looking back is just destructive. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, Martin. Yeah, I think um, both uh, Councillor Rob and the Mayor's contribution has been very valuable. I think uh, what we can't do enough of, and this is where I'm just going to come back to what I said in questions around the comms team, through all of our um, communication outlets, our website, our city news, we can't actually explain enough, in my view, uh, the, the means and the methodology uh, you know, by which we um, measure uh, our books and our performance. I think also what's really important in terms of, uh, and it is related, uh, some media stories over the weekend that we keep stressing in terms of our journey, even the way we rate you know, capital value, etc., and how we uh, look at our books is that we are moving into a consistency essentially with the rest of the country, particularly with the rest of the high growth metros, Auckland, Tauranga being a, a really good example. And I don't think we can do enough of that. I don't think we can do enough of saying that basically Hamilton, in terms of its measurement, in terms of its rating system, etc., etc., is merely coming into sync, really with the other high growth metros. Um, but I think it's been a very worthwhile discussion. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just finish off by, uh, sorry, is no one else? I'll just finish off by saying, look, it is really, really, really important that we have clarity as to whether or not we are meeting our day-to-day -day costs from our day-to-day -day revenues. If we find a situation where we aren't, then we are focused, you know, faced with two decisions. Do we cut, do we increase revenue or do we, do we um, uh, reduce expenses. That's a debate for another day, but it is unbelievably important that we know that position, whether or not we are meeting our day-to-day -day costs from our day-to-day -day revenue. That was what I intended to do here, and I think the new 
t uh, the balancing the books uh, disclosure that we have in the uh, ten year plan goes a good way uh, way towards doing that for us. Um, Mark, I realise I've come after you right a reply, but I just, I just don't know, <laughs> something that might add to this debate if it's all right, yeah. and that is um, it goes back to my question about the other councils and their measures, and I think what we'll find, and you know, you're right, our rates, our homeowners are not contributing enough. Um, to meet the day-to-day -day running of the city. Um, and that really actually speaks to the model of rating in New Zealand. Our risk of sounding too philosophical, um, if you go to America, etc., they're taxed on everything and they pay for a large amount of things, but they seem to run it a wee bit better locally uh, over there. And it speaks to the, um, the road tax or the, the petrol tax debate. If we can possibly find other um, sources of income, then our books surely will be in a better shape. In the meantime, until all councils are unified in their measure, there's no one voice to which we can go to central with which we can go to central government and say, "Hey, this model is broken." Um, and I feel that there might even be. And while the government isn't asking us to report in a unified way, the, you know, I, the cynic in me would suggest a little bit of divide and conquer going on between the local and central government. So I would, uh, you know, try and I'd like to use this platform to call on the government to call for a unified reporting system that is fair across all councils. Um, and so we can see if it is the councils that aren't running well or the model that is broken, I suggest that it's the second one. OK, thank you. Any more uh, debate? All right. Um, I move that the... Uh, has it been done that? OK, we'll just vote. Those in favour? Any against? Bob against. Thank you. All right, gentlemen. Uh, I think we're Stuart... Yes, we've got the Waikato Innovation, please. Earl and Stuart. Yes. And Blair. Morning, everyone. Just like to introduce um, Earl Rattray, who's a, a, a board member of Waikato Innovation Growth Limited and New Zealand Food Innovation Waikato Limited, and Stuart Gordon, who's the chief executive of both those companies. They're here today to present... Sorry, members, we're on page 18 of our agenda, so I didn't tell you what page we're on. ...here to present both the six monthly accounts for the group of companies and a statement of intent for the year starting July of this year. Just a quick bit of context, um, so that the group of companies, Waikato Innovation Group and, New and Food Waikato, came out of the restructure of Waikato Innovation Park <coughs> following the sale of that um, property division late last year. So. The, the companies that you're hearing about today, we've always had an ownership stake in these companies. They are now just separated out in terms of their own identity. So these companies are located on the Innovation Park campus and comprise both the economic development activities and the food spray drying activities in New Zealand food. So I'll hand over to Earl and Stuart to present the six monthly accounts in the statement of intent. Thank you, Blair. And, uh, um Chairman uh, Gary and councillors, um, very, very happy to be here um, for our routine section 64 reporting. Uh, I'm filling in for Barry Harris, our board chair, who uh, passes his apologies, uh, but I'm very happy to report uh, on behalf of the board um, that we're very satisfied with um, progress uh, since the restructure. Uh, the um, the transition has happened, um, I think, very, very smoothly and very well. Um, more importantly, it hasn't interrupted business, um, uh, particularly for the subsidiary food innovation Waikato, which is um, uh, the drying business there uh, and the supporting um, services that go with that uh, is continuing to progress, um, certainly um, well above plan uh, at the moment. And as you're aware, there is um, uh, uh, quite um, ambitious growth plans for that, um, for that business and for the services that it provides. So I'm going to um, happily pass over to Stuart Gordon, um, our CEO, uh, to report on the numbers, and we'll certainly be happy to take any questions um, or engage in any conversation you want at the conclusion of that. Thank you. Mr Chairman, uh, first I'll comment on the half yearly report. Um, the financials show that we're ahead of our um, budget and ahead of our forecast. Um, main comment around that is that we are actually uh, performing with our customers and moving to more, more higher value 
products, mainly infant formulas. So we are actually uh, our revenue, and, our, and as a result, our profits have increased as our customers go to more high value. Now, this has taken quite a bit of our intellectual property uh, to actually achieve that. So it's great for the industry, and this is mainly in the sheep uh, milk industry where we're seeing the growth of brand new infant formulas going up into Asia. Uh, so that's the overall comment as to why we're performing better than budget. Uh, the growth business continues. In fact, it has actually grown, performing so well that uh, central government has requested us to uh, take on more people. As a result of that, we're actually performing ahead of budget and uh, well on, um, on uh, our target of uh, dealing with 400 businesses. We're actually aiming to achieve something like 460 businesses. We'll be giving grants, et cetera, out to it. Um, so th I don't know if there's any questions. It's all been circulated about our quarterly report, our half yearly report. Thanks, Stuart. <clears throat> um, um, OK, this is page 19 of our, our agenda. Sorry, we're in that situation where um, you talk about operational figures. Yep. How do you get 577 days? We, we effectively have two factories. Something's wrong with your reporting. We have two factories. You could theoretically do th um, 365 times twice. We have a dryer, and then we have a what we call our wet side kitchen, and we put a day on that as being one day and one day on, on the dryer. That's how we're able to measure because a key, key driver of profitability and achievement in our uh, thoughts around value added is how much we use the wet side. Now that might be disguised by the fact we run the dryer mm. and just make whole milk powder versus running our kitchen and running high value products. So we try and use that as a key measure. Which do you call the wet side? It's, it's a front end kitchen, you could say, where yeah. you add a whole lot of ingredients together. Yeah. Um, when you put out an infant formula, in fact, dairy products actually only make up about 40% of that. Oils, vitamins and minerals and other ingredients. I'm sorry if you include lactose, yep. it's a bit more, but yeah, are okay. added to this, to this whole milk powder. So you go from a product that's uh, on a wholesale value maybe worth about $15,000 to something worth $40,000 through this additive process. And so we put a lot of emphasis on measuring that wet side as well as our dryer. Hence, we effectively run two factories. Okay, and that's, thank you. That's explanation. On page, actually, you've got page numbers here. Yeah, page four of your, so, so members, that's page 23 of our agenda, but I think it's page four of your report. You talk about key assumptions, and one of those is that the business growth RPP contract has a further 19 months to go. Is that what we call colloquially the um, Callaghan grants, is it? It's got two parts. It's Callaghan Grants and NZT Grants. Callahan, and what, what was the second one? New Zealand Trade and Enterprise oh, okay. Grants. First one is about research and development, uh, startup businesses, um, finding experts, that sort of area. That's from Callaghan. And NZT is about capability within businesses. So we give out funding to businesses, a dollar for dollar, to build, say, um, one of the manager wants to go on a training uh, scheme. So it's basically training to build businesses involved in export, and um, that's available to any business up to 50 employees. Okay, thank you. Just to clarify for the council, that um, that activity, the economic development activity, is fully funded by the government, including all of the costs that the, the company incurs. So, so it is a, it's a, um, so not only the grants fully funded, but also the administration costs, the staff salaries. And all the overhead is also fully funded by the government. So, yeah. so that is a cost-neutral activity. In fact, it makes a small, small surplus. That activity is what is proposed for 1 July to transfer across the new regional economic development agency, which this council has been supportive of through the long-term plan process. Thank it you. also includes, Mr Chairman, mentors also goes inside that bucket as well, the mentors business. Thank you. Uh, Ziggy. The report. Look, you were just mentioning about exporting mainly to Asia with the infant formula. I, I'm just curious or interested, which which are the main countries you export to? Um, certainly our main uh, country that our customers go to is definitely China, okay. though um, diversification is the name of the game. So uh, our customers are looking to diversify into places like Mar Malaysia and Korea and uh, even into the USA. But 
most of them are, tr um, are while they're focused because it's actually probably the most profitable market at the moment in China. Um, others are also focused on diversifying. Okay, thank you. That's all. Thank you. Just to be clear, Ziggy, um, they're not your customers. Your customers are the people who you do the drying for. The yeah, yeah. So our customers, and, but we have to meet the requirements. Each one of yes. those countries has different. What's um, yeah, requirements, so all our manufacturing requirements can meet depending on the country, and we have to be um, MPI uh, audit us on the basis, country by country, that product, where it goes. Thank you. Uh, Ryan. Thanks. Um, just on your half-yearly report, uh, just, just really a, a query. Um, at the top under financial results, you've got year-ending forecasts. Give us year a page number, Ryan. Sorry, uh, it's 19 oh. of our page. They've just got year-ending forecast and year-ending budget. And I was just wondering what's the difference between the two? Uh, our year-end was our budget we put at the beginning of the year. Um, as we have in the statement of intent here, a budget for the following year. That's what sits there solid. Our forecast is where we expect to end up. Uh, and hence the difference is we're actually expecting uh, our group net profit to be 365000 versus the budget was 233000 Is that the question? Yeah, just getting clarification yeah. around that. So, so your forecast is slightly different from your budget and that it's more of an actual, is it? Yeah, that's exactly right. It follows the actuals. Okay, thank you. And it's reviewed on a monthly basis. Mark. Quickly, um, thanks for the report. The, uh, the, there's a new infant formula factory starting up. The Chinese are starting one up shortly, is that right? Um, there's probably, I know, of three or four. Okay. Um, factories proposed or starting uh, around the place. Um, if your question is what does it affect on impact? us, mm. um, we're focused very much around uh, the sheep milk and goat milk or high value ingredients. So when you're uh, looking at a factory that's going to produce bovine, and I'm thinking based on my knowledge, most of those factories are about five tonne an hour minimum, mm. maybe eight tonne an hour manufacturing base, mm -hmm. whereas ours at the moment produces half a tonne or 1.2 tonne an hour will be the new. It's a different space we're actually looking in. Right, right. Um, if you start to think how much it, uh, it needs to fill up our factory, uh, it's 65,000 litres. The amount of use to produce that is 30,000 use. That's a lot of use. Now, mm -hmm. in sheep terms, that's a lot of numbers, and same with goat. So you're in quite a different dynamics than bovine. So if somebody was to go and take sheep milk to one of these factories and produce it for only, say, one or two hours, it's uneconomical. Right. Hence why you need these small factories. And an example is dairy goat factories is, I think, two tonne an hour. Mm -hmm. Again, small, but catering to that what we call small ruminum uh, market. Right. So most, well, all those factories are a lot larger than that, catering to the bovine market. Okay, so if... if uh, if we start to look even better, is there a chance of more competition coming in? Uh, yes, know? we actually hope, you know, as uh, part of our role, um, that right, in yeah, three, five years' time, somebody else builds another factory for the sheep milk because it's gone to a n new mm. level. Um, we always be a role for the smaller factory, but that's what we're actually aiming to achieve. Great. Right. That in three years' time, outside of Hamilton, there's a, a large factory catering for the sheep milk industry. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Leah? Yeah, I noticed that uh, Blue River Dairy, which is an Invercargill company, mm. by the way, do they have their own dryer down there? They do um, a very uh, a dryer that can just do um, whole milk powders, so not infant formula. It doesn't have both the, um, the wet end as well as the systems to be able to produce infant formula. So do they... Um transport milk from Invercargill up to here? Powder. powder, whole milk powder. So they make the whole milk powder, we bring it up, we mix it with a whole lot of other things yeah. and produce Put infant the They're a very successful company. I think they're in the Deloitte top 50 growth company last year, mainly around the assistance mm. that we have to give them. And how much would they be bringing up on a, say, a weekly basis, oh. roughly? <clears throat> I'd just be guessing um, at what it is, but let's say... I'm just working up my top of head. No, I'll just be guessing yeah, yeah. what it is, but oh, 
just comes across on Andrew Island, I suppose. And at, at, at some point in time, we're hoping, because we run our capabilities, that a drier down South Island will actually be built to cater for them. Um, because we've set them on the journey, they're extremely successful, uh, they're at a critical point. We know of some discussions they're having with somebody down there, but I can't obviously mention what those are, but that's our job to actually get this economy going. Thanks, Leo. Paula? Thank you, Mr Chair. And on that note, um, the role of uh, this business is around incubating new ideas, isn't it, and innovating. So last time I visited, which was my previous role, you were also um, trialling drying of other things besides, besides uh, milk-based products. Um, I think kiwi fruit and other mm. e enzymes and, and derivatives, nutraceuticals and so on. So would you still see that as a part of the, part of the um, opportunity going forward to, to do those niche, niche markets around high there, nutrition there foods? There is a real opportunity in two areas, high value ingredients that go into these sort of things in performance. <coughs> mm. And we'll, we've one of our customers is exactly in that area. Um, but also uh, drying, we, we previously did avocado. But what we've That's found, right, if, we do, if we do dairy infant formulas, um, our customers don't look kind on the fact we're using, going through the factory, some of these other products. Mm. So what we undertook is a, um, we did a paper that was distributed and available publicly um, about alternative drying technologies for the horticultural industry and the meat industry. Um, it was worked through with Callaghan. That paper, uh, and now as a result of that, a major business case has been developed by a company to implement that for the horticulture industry. Um, I obviously can't mention where it is no, and thing, but it's okay. on a reasonable large scale and a major leap forward for the horticulture industry. Basing it on the Waikato model, an open access dryer that allows this industry to grow, and um, all a result of what we did and the result of the, the business case we developed for this, this bunch of industries. So do we derive any income from the intellectual property that you develop? I mean, I know it's about building a, a strong economy and looking for the next opportunity for those you know, high-end products and things, but... If we do the work, we've got to sustain ourselves in the long term. If we do that work, do we derive any benefit from it? Um, we derived a wee bit of benefit from that, to be honest, um, very little. Um, I think there's some more greater opportunities uh, that we have in front of us on segregating out into other products, uh, high-value products <coughs> based around the dairy industry um, and allowing the horticulture industry, which is a, works under different regulations, to develop themselves. True. I was just um, picking up on your comment about diversity, however, and I guess um, the whole innovation park concept is about you know finding the next big new thing and driving that forward. So yeah, you would. We've got a couple of big plans yeah. going forward for new, completely new types of products or things that had not been done before. Um, trying to um, develop those. Um, yeah. And you'd either put them into practice on the site with your expansion, perhaps? Yes. Or you would sell that technology, sell those that... Well, we work with our customers and take part of the value chain okay. of our customers. Generally, okay. we, we generally wouldn't sell ourselves. We're working with a specific customer yeah. and um, charge them part of that value chain. Right, so, so there mm. is that payback. Yes. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and before I put the motion, I'd just like to thank uh, Earl and Stu for the work you've done over many years uh, in the many iterations of the innovation work that goes out there. So thank you very much. Um, I'd like to move uh, the staff recommendation. We receive the report and approve the uh, Waikato Innovation Growth Limited Group of Companies draft statement of intent. I'll move Andrew... OK. Mallet uh, Southgate. Uh, any debate? OK, those in favour, those against, I think that was unanimous. Thank you. OK, now we've got another report here, which is the bringing back of a report regarding the structure of the new enterprises out there being made into CCOs. We've had a discussion at a council meeting, I think it was, which then morphed into a staff briefing um, where we 
address this. So that's what we're dealing with now. So we're now the late item, which is uh, Waikato Innovation Growth Limited. Uh, so item number seven. Uh, no, I beg your pardon. I item number doesn't have an item number because it's late. Yeah. So it's under separate. It has got a number, has it? Okay. Sixteen. Does everyone know what report we're talking about? It's yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I, look, I won't speak to the report a lot because we have covered it in the briefing. What I would note is that the I have attached the copy of the briefing slides to the report. However, the investor names uh, I've just changed those to ABC because those names still remain uh, confidential um, at, at the present time. But the, the matter is certainly a matter of public record. It's just the investor names are confidential. Uh, the proposal today is to delegate um, to the Chief Executive the ability to, to finalise the consultation document, to then undertake public consultation for a period up to two weeks on the proposal to establish the three CCOs under the limited partnership structure, um, and then to consider the submissions and then make any final decisions in, in relation to the limited partnership structure. Um, I'll just reiterate the main point that came through from the, the briefing was that the Limited partnership structure, whilst it's new to council, is a very common business structure in New Zealand and internationally. Uh, it's certainly something that the investors and Callaghan are both very, very supportive of, as long with, along with the board. And importantly, the structure was chosen, the main reason the structure was chosen was to enable the, the governance and the operation of the two spray dryers to be conducted by New Zealand Food, but maintaining the ownership of the second spray dryer quite separate from the first spray dryer but to allow the management team and the Board of New Zealand Food to operate the two spray dryers as if they are one, the limited partnership structure provided that opportunity. And that was the main reason why that structure was chosen over all other structures <coughs> uh, presented to the Board and was, was the basis of our conversation at the briefing. But happy to uh, hand it over Thanks, to Thanks, Blair. Any questions? All right, if there are no questions, I'll move well, the staff the recommendation. Question. Pardon? Need your board. Did you just put that down then? No, no, no. <laughs> I, look, I only have one question about the, uh, uh, as you'd expect from me, the public engagement period. Uh, Blair, what's the magic of two weeks? Well, um, it's not governed by a special consultative procedure, Councillor Gallagher, so we conducted a similar consultation when we established the Waikato Innovation Group Limited Company. So. Um, propose to do something similar. Um, we, we will obviously undertake appropriate communications. It's a relatively technical matter. Right. Um, and we don't assess this as a high matter of significance. And so therefore the two weeks period was seen as a... As so a the people you would expect to be having some input would be across this anyway Correct. and would be expected to be... Um, ..regularly aware of Correct. reading these type of communications. That's correct. OK, thank you. Okay, I'll move. Do I have a seconder? Mallet, Cassins, uh, moved and seconded. Is there any debate? Andrew. <coughs> Other companies to prosper in the Waikato. Um, I don't think it was any secret that I'm not comfortable with Hamilton City Council being involved in spray dryers and making malt powder. Um, but I also understand that we're trapped in this system and it's very difficult for us to get out of it due to complex um, ownership matters and funding that's been given in the past. Um, I just also want to point out to members on page five, there's no known risks associated with the decisions that we're making today. And paragraph 23, the structure does not inhibit uh, council in the future from selling its shareholding in New Zealand food. Um, and saying that there are appropriate reasons why we are involved, and that's um, some of the funding that has come through in the past has come in because of our association and because we as a council have been involved. So... Um, it's, it's complex. I believe the board does an extremely good job in um, doing what they do, and it just happens that we're a shareholder in this group of companies, and um, we can't. It's very difficult to unravel that. So I'm very supportive of of accepting uh, what we're doing and the reasons why, because they make a whole lot of financial sense. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. There are no more names, unless you're going to put one down, Martin. Not going to do it this time. Oh. 
<laughs> Thank you. It's, it's, look, this, that uh, was a joke, mate. <laughs> you've, you've, you've totally uh, provoked me, but I just say this is an ongoing wonderful legacy of people who had vision to establish a science park, including the previous government and Minister Jim Anderton, Jim Sutton, and also local MP Diane Yates. But in the end, this is a journey. And, and this has been a wonderful legacy. This is a journey that didn't involve just central government. This was an example of amazing local advocacy, of which a um, couple are sitting at the bottom of the table in terms of you know, that ongoing. So this, to me, is a classic win-win. The mayor, however, is right. There's a point at which council will exit, you know, because I do agree with the mayor. Probably the brief of local government is not to be in this kind of business, but it is a, a journey which is, uh, frankly, an excellent journey. Thank you for inviting me to speak, Mr Chair. <laughs> I won't Chair. do that again, Martin. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, there's no further debate. Uh, I'll put the motion. Those in favour? Those against, is there anyone against? OK, thank you. That's thank you. Can, uh, passed unanimously. Thank you very much again, guys. I appreciate it. Um, OK, we've now got the Waikato... So item 8, Waikato Regional Airport, uh, six-monthly report and statement of intent. Got Mark. What's Mark? Oh, there's Mark. Yes. <laughs> Mark and Sean. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, if I could just um, introduce Annabelle Cotton to you once oh, again, Annabelle, who's please. a director of the board of the Waikato Regional Airport Limited, and Mark Morgan, who's just getting his um, PowerPoint show ready, who's the uh, chief executive officer. And if, I think it'd be uh, easier if I just handed it straight over to Mark, Mr. Chair, for him to. Uh, uh, put forward his presentation. Thank you. Morning. I think we've just got a uh, just a sec bringing up the presentation, which I know you don't have in front of you, so it's probably quite critical that you can read it. Is it different than what we've got in the agenda? Because we have quite uh, a bit of reporting yes, yes. reporting in the agenda. Yes, it is different. Oh, it's it is a, different. It's okay. a summation. Okay. Is there room for that one to go in? Just so I can... No, it's just for the PowerPoint. Okay. Click on. Should this... Okay. <laughs> I've, seen waiting. That, I've seen that before. Does that bring that up? Sean's not a very good assistant. <laughs> dressed up for the ball and someone cancels it. <laughs> the band hasn't showed up. The awkward conversation begins. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, can we get an update on the cricket? Oh, oh. who? <clears throat> Clearly not focusing on the council. <laughs> I'm no longer an accountant. <laughs> Do you want to just default back to what's in here? Here we go. Here we go. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, that adds heaps. Counting your support, Mark. I'll just click through it, Sean. Yeah. No, this should, should not just be a pointer, so you have to click it through. Alright. 
to the middle of the slide, Charlie. Thank you. Okay, apologies for that, uh, for that brief delay. We've just got a short presentation here. Um, there's about sort of 10 slides, so I will move it through relatively quickly so that I can also take any questions. But essentially, a uh, commentary on our statement of intent, our um, year-to-date highlights for the group. Uh, today, I'll talk about, uh, obviously, the airport operation and our property company. I won't be talking about um, Hamilton Waikato Tourism, which is a separate presentation to you. Then some information on our, on our uh, flight trends, our group financials, and our focus for the balance of this year. So, uh, firstly, the statement of intent. You've had a briefing on our draft statement of intent. I think the key messages here is that our statement of intent uh, for 1819 is very similar to, the, to this current year and indeed the previous year's statement of intent. So the core purpose, particularly around um, our, uh, uh, running a, a profitable regional airport, uh, and you can see running across um, all of the safe and compliant, et cetera, et cetera, optimise um, our land holdings, uh, and of course run a successful tourism uh, venture are still key to the purpose of the group and the key objectives, which of course are listed below, um, really remain unchanged. Uh, other than, of course, the financials, which have been updated for the next three-year period. Thanks, Sean. So just moving through to our highlights for the year, and some of these will be in a, a, a bit more detail as we move into the presentation. But uh, firstly, for the airport operation in isolation, uh, so the uh, entity we call the parent, uh, net profit after tax of 184000 which was a solid financial uh, performance, and you'll see further on that significantly up on prior years for the same reporting period. Uh, that's been supported, of course, by the growth in passenger numbers, 12% year on year, uh, and also uh, significant growth in aircraft movements. Just to remind Council that we are the second uh, largest certified airport in terms of um, aircraft movements, so we'll have approximately 140,000 oh, aircraft movements this financial year. Put that into some context for you, Hamilton and Christchurch are about 70,000, uh, sorry, uh, Wellington and Christchurch are about 70,000 movements, so uh, that's pr principally driven by the activity of um, L3, the flight school. Uh, some great uh, progress in customer experience, which we'll come to. Social media, um, if you're not following Hamilton Airport on uh, social media, please do. So we launched a very comprehensive social media uh, campaign through Facebook and Instagram uh, just prior to Christmas, and that's had a uh, very significant uptake, and it's been a way of communicating, communicating some of the, the key messages and, in fact, dispelling some of the key myths. Um, and of course, we remain safe and compliant. So from a shareholder perspective, there has been no serious incidents to report at the, um, uh, within the group, particularly the airport, in this reporting period. So just looking at passenger numbers for a moment there, and if you have that slide in front of you, but if you don't, it is up on the screen. Um, the key point to, to draw your attention to, of course, is... Uh, sorry, that's, is that flip? Past, yep, not at, my apologies. Um, just drawing you to the to the left hand side. First of all, so 24 flights per day in and out of the airport during weekdays, and 15 flights per day on the weekend. I think it's just a, a important to to restate that. So there is a reasonable lift in, in flight activity. Um, I mentioned that flights are up 12 percent. That growth is coming across our sectors of um, uh, Palmerston North, Wellington and Christchurch, but particularly Christchurch, which now has, is up 20-odd percent, and that's the second year of significant growth. So very strong growth there. Also, the com combination now being able to fly to and from Wellington via Palmerston North has also lifted that sector. The same time in New Zealand, uh, at the bottom right, our loading factors in New Zealand have introduced an additional 18 odd thousand seats in that reporting period. Um, and those seats have been more than consumed because we've also seen our loading slightly increase as well. So in New Zealand, we'll put about 50,000 additional seats into the market over the next, um, uh, over this 12 month period. 
Yeah, some of that, most of, most of that, some of it is bigger planes, Paula. Some of it's the up gauging to the um, ATR, the 68-seater from the Q300. Um, and, of course, we've, we've now been operating the Q300, the 50-seater, and the 68-seaters are the only in New Zealand commercial planes into, into Hamilton. Mm. Um, and we have seen an additional couple of flights uh, as well. So just moving on to our property. Property has been a significant focus for the uh, company in the past uh, six months. It's been a very busy period, both in terms of land uh, sales and land inquiries, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you on a map on the next slide, which uh, in a moment. Also, the acquisition of the airport motor in, which uh, settled in January of this year, uh, preceded by a, quite a significant period of negotiation in the last quarter of um, 2017. And then the work that we continue to do around um, our access for NZTA. Uh, to change our access point of entries on State Highway 21, uh, which has been, um, uh, which is resulting in ultimately uh, lodging a private plan change, which we're doing with Waipa Council next month, uh, with the support of NZTA and with Waipa. So uh, I'll talk a bit about that under 2018. On the next slide, and I'm, I had hoped that let's hope and see where the technology works here, whether this. Um, whether I can pick up this clicker, which I don't appear to be able to do. It's not reading. Yeah. Um, look, probably the best way I can describe this, if you can see the map, um, is it, councillors, do you have the map in front of you or not? You do, okay. So look, uh, at the bottom of the map, you'll see the terminal, bottom sort of centre, centre left, um, as you look at the map, and you'll see the orange um, and blue shaded sections there. That's the land on the central precinct that has been sold. So, in fact, this map, because it's a, it's a dynamic um, uh, moving feast, um, virtually all of the land that we have available on that central precinct is now either sold or um, uh, under final negotiation. Uh, and including, we've opened up another 250 metres of roading that will be completed uh, at the end of April. Uh, so we have, we've very successfully sold uh, about two and a half hectares of land on the central. Uh, and if you look on the opposite side of the runway, you'll see a orange and blue uh, rectangle of sections up by the old aviation precinct there. Uh, we've also actually now sold both of those sections. Uh, that, that's land that's really been surplus to rail, I would say, for 30 or 40 years and that land we have now sold as well. So, uh, in essence, um, that has allowed us to probably sell land, uh, it's about three, three million odd dollars worth of land sales, and that's certainly allowing the, uh, the group to re-focus um, that capital on acquisitions such as the airport hotel. Um, and then down to the south, if you look at the map, to the, to the left at the bottom, is the opening up of the southern precinct, and that is land that we intend to open up um, for sale and development uh, once we are successful with our private plan change, which allows access directly off State Highway 21 and not internally through the, um, through the airport. Uh, so the focus very much remains on, um, uh, I may have mentioned to you last time, Rail at the moment is a bit of a reluctant um, uh, developer. We intend to become a property investor, so the sale of this land uh, is providing uh, capital uh, to develop uh, our land holdings and ultimately to assist with, uh, with seed money to look for our own design build opportunities as well. Um, and look, and, we, and you know of course from our last discussions, we own the farm, which is up to the top right of your map. Uh, and we have the 100 hectare farm in there as well. So that's pretty much the property sale story. Um, moving on to the financials, uh, and again, uh, as I've mentioned to you, a, a pretty good uh, first six month reporting period. So revenue up 12%. Um, this is the airport operation, first of all. Um, Essentially, our car park revenue was up a similar number, 12%. Our landing charges were up 7% because of the greater flight activity and passenger numbers. And our terminal charges were up 13%. Uh, 
Um, our rentals and concessions were up 18%, and I think that's worth just a mention here that um, uh, we have been able to maximise our non-aeronautical income, uh, particularly as we renegotiate ground leases. Uh, we've also secured uh, new rental streams. Uh, we have leased out uh, what was the old uh, a part of the international terminal downstairs to all three to, for two classrooms that we're currently um, constructing for them. Uh, and there have been a, a number of other, uh, of course, the addition now to the airport hotel that will run lease streams um, from January. So all in all, um, uh, we're very pleased with, with that contribution. Obviously, that's flowed through to EBITDA, and you can see the trend over the last five years for the, uh, for the sorry for the airport operation, and leading through to a half-year result um, of uh, the uh, on the right-hand side there of the 160 odd thousand dollars, um, which is the best halfway position that uh, the airport has had for about seven years. Sorry. 184. Right. I'm looking at another number on my ship. My, yes. Okay. Net profit after tax, 184, Gary. Thank you. Yes. Right, when I normally average, I normally go the other way, so I don't know why I, I undershot yeah. that one. Um, the group financial performance, so very much at the half year, a flow through um, uh, of revenue EBITDA. The point I want to, and net profit after tax, the group result does not look quite as impressive as, as the parent result, and that's principally because of the lag in the settlement of land um, sales, which have which uh, flowed through in January between January and May this year. So we have the costs of Titanium Park in the first six months, but no compensating. Uh, land sales to offset. Um, so still a, uh, a, an acceptable rot result, but you may have wondered why that um, hasn't quite flowed through from the airport operation. Um, and I'll talk under our um, FY18 activity as to our view of full year financial performance for the group. Um, and then next through to the balance sheet, again, not a lot of change since we last presented to you after year end. So uh, assets uh, well up principally as, as a result of the valuations of our land and investment and development properties. Um, liabilities up uh, marginally, principally again the net uh, funding of the airport hotel um, and of course uh, the uh, shareholder equity up significantly as well. So uh, the balance sheet in, in very good shape. Looking forward now to 2018, um, firstly we're just uh, in the process of um, our uh, updating our 10 year strategic plan. So certainly some of the activity we're seeing at the airport, uh, particularly in respect of property, has been um, perhaps at a, at a much faster rate than we would have envisaged a couple of years ago. Um, so it's about ensuring that that property strategy um, still aligns with the group strategy. So we will um, uh, finish that uh, and uh, present that to the board towards the middle of this year, and I'm sure We'll give the shareholders some update on that, uh, perhaps at the... Mark, should that be 2019? It should be. Yeah. My apologies. That's right. It should be 2019. Oh, sorry, uh, Gary, it's a slight... It's in the current... So this is the six-month, really, focus, if you like, between... January to June 18. Oh, okay, so you're still so some of this that. will run okay. into the 18 19 year. Yep. That's essentially the balance of focus so, for, the, okay. for the balance of the current financial year. Um, so, uh, full year profitability. Um, again, um, I mentioned to you that uh, with the significant land sales settling in the second six months, we would expect the group forecast. Um, uh, net profit um, after tax to be somewhere in the vicinity of 800 to 1.2 million. So a significant increase on prior year and a significant increase on um, um, our budgeted position, which was in fact a break-even uh, position for the group. Uh, and uh, really that, that uh, forecast is pretty secure. Uh, given we only have one uh, property sale at the moment that remains conditional as, as I speak to you. 
Um, the other major piece of work is the landing charge review. You may or may not be aware, but once every five years we have the opportunity to renegotiate our landing charges with the airlines. Principally for us, that's Air New Zealand, but it also has a general aviation impact as well. Um, so that's a um, consultation, not a negotiation. There's obviously a statutory framework under which we consult. Um, we've begun that work uh, to understand exactly um, uh, what uh, Rail's position should be in those negotiations. We have an independent consultant that has handled uh, the work for Rail on the last two reviews and also uh, does that for a number of other airports. Uh, I'll be in a position perhaps during May and June to brief the Rail Board on um, at what we believe to be the most appropriate way forward uh, for that landing charge uh, review. Uh, I would envisage that uh, those that uh, any, any outcomes of that review, uh, and if it's favourable, uh, those landing charges would be implemented towards the end of 2018 or early 2019. We have up until April 19 to complete that, um, that review with, uh, with uh, particularly Air New Zealand. Um, and then looking at the hotel operating structure, so we're currently working with a, a consultant uh, a, again around how we would operate the motor in long term, uh, and that work will be finalised uh, with a recommendation to the Rail Board about uh, June of this year as well. The incumbent is leasing back the um, hotel buildings uh, until at least February 19. Uh, he has a, uh, an option through to February 20, but if Rao chooses to exercise its option and bring it forward to February 19, it can. So uh, that's uh, currently uh, being worked through. And then uh, there's some work going on into a terminal refresh at the moment. So as you come out to the airport over the next six months, you'll start to see some subtle changes, but some important changes in some of the visuals, seating and, and other um, aspects of the terminal uh, as you pass through it. And then we have our, our typical Capital Works uh, program, but a couple of um, significant ones is a car park upgrade. So we're just finishing the scope on that at the moment. And again, those of you that fly through the airport will see over the next um, four or five months some activity in terms of a car park upgrade. Um, and that's about ensuring we have sufficient parking, but we also replace some of the ageing uh, equipment. Uh, and then there's some other work, particularly around fire tender replacement. We, we have a major requirement to upgrade the fire tenders, and we're just working through that business case as we speak. Um, I think finally for, for property, um, very much uh, as I've mentioned to you, the continuation of opening up the central and southern precincts by, the, by ensuring the private plan changes is completed. Um, and uh, uh, in terms of the farm, we're just working through some options and we'll begin to start some work on uh, master planning the farm. In terms of its opportunity, you might recall that it has 40 hectares of zoned industrial commercial land as well as 60 hectares of rural. So uh, we're just starting that early journey in terms of the options uh, for the farm. And, um, and then, as I've mentioned, uh, the design build. Uh, we have some work really to do here around the profile of customer we're looking to attract. At the moment, most most of the businesses we are attracting are looking to do the developments themselves, so they're, look, they're smaller uh, owner-operators that see the land and buildings as part of their superannuation fund and not necessarily interested in, in leasing land and buildings. So that's forcing us to reflect perhaps on, on, the, on the customer profile that we're, we're, we'll need to attract to make that happen in future. Um, so that's, in a nutshell, sorry I've skimmed through that a wee bit, but in a nutshell that's the, uh, that's the operation of the, um, of the airport and the property company in that six month period. Thank you Mark. Um, just one question I've got, uh, on, in our agenda page, uh, sorry, Page 35, paragraph 6, or bullet point 6, talks about land sales valued at 2.2 million, of which 1.1 million remain condi conditional. Has that subsequently become It has. Some of that land has subsequently become un okay. unconditional, Gary. Right, yes. Thank you. 
Um, then on paragraph 30, uh, page 38 of our agenda, uh, paragraph, uh, it's paragraph 4, they're not um, noted, it talks about um, uh, considerable land sale required during, sorry, considerable land sale inquiries during the reporting period resulted in 1.1 million of unconditional land sales and 1.1 of conditional land sales. Is that a typo or is that accurate? That was accurate when the report was written. Okay, Gary. so they're now all... So we, we, we've had um, properties go unconditional in January and February of this year. Okay, cool. Yep. Thank you. Um, how do I get back to the other one? Bigger? Smash it how hard? Thank you. Uh, Mark. Just a, a couple of wee ones. I could ask 40 questions, as you probably gathered. Um, this is fascinating stuff. Um, uh, but, 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 but New Zealand's engineering services pulling out of, uh, of the regions, how does that affect us and who owns the facility that they fix the planes in? And is there an opportunity there? Uh, so firstly, uh, New Zealand have signalled that intention over perhaps the last 12 to 18 months that they would be um, reducing their engineering base here in, in, in Hamilton. Uh, as they have done in other regional ports, and that's been, they, so they have been growing their regional servicing base in Nelson. Mm. Um, they're tending to service now in uh, towns or cities where there is significant overnighting of the aircraft. So we're not, so, so we've been well appraised of the situation. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, we own the land, so there's a ground, ground lease on the land under the hangars. Uh, in New Zealand obviously own the improvements and um, so they are considering their options at the moment and we are discussing with them so... Oh, okay, so they haven't uh, it yet. Is... Oh, no, sorry, their service... The, yes, <coughs> they're looking at options to either sublease the facility right. um, to a third party. So we're okay. just working through those options uh, with them. Uh, they have a lease uh, on the... Uh, they have a ground lease through till 2021 with two five-year rights of renewal after that date. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, we're the landlord and we can't unreasonably mm. withhold any consent in that process. We're just interested to ensure that the facility is well utilised. So have they pulled out of Hamilton or not? They, yes, they, ha they, yes, they have, they absolutely. Like yes. Okay, yes. Cool. So they, they had about 40 there when I joined two and a half years ago mm. and they're down mm. to about 12, I think, at the moment, 12 or 14, but they are, they are pulling out of those, uh, out of servicing completely. Okay, cool. Um, Uber, I asked you that last time. Has that had any effect or is there, how's that going? Uh, look, it, it's not going uh, really at all from the airport. So at the moment, uh, we're still waiting on Uber to sign a contract with the airport company. Um, they've been intending to do so for the past month and we're just awaiting the, the presentation of that contract. Oh, yeah. We have agreed terms and we've been very supportive of Uber entering to the market, right. as long as it's on what I would term a fair playing field, so uh, full disclosure of their Uber activity at the airport, which they're happy to do. At the moment, if you try and... Uh, and yeah, the, right. the, the app has right. changed, you can't book an Uber from Hamilton Airport at the oh, moment okay. because they haven't completed those that com those commercial arrangements with us. All right, so how much can you tell us about what they where they will go and what they'll be able I to do? I can't tell you anything, Mark, because okay. uh, other than they intend to provide a full service once it's available right. from the airport. So I guess... Um, uh, but how we are slightly frustrated. Here? We're still waiting on that contract okay. to be able to complete. Yeah, cool. Um, and uh, what sort of nick is the hotel and like, how much work needs to be done on it? Look, I think there's, uh, th there is certainly deferred maintenance on the hotel that will need to be um, considered. Uh, we, as you would expect during our due diligence, um, had a full con condition assessment done of the property. Um, I think how and w how and when and who pays for the upgrade uh, and any upgrade or remediation of the, of the facility will be somewhat dependent on the commercial arrangements we mm. enter into with, uh, with a hotel operator. Right. So we would be looking for an operator to, to be involved long term, um, uh, but just how that's funded and whether that's uh, the, the mechanism for funding that upgrade will be determined over the next yeah. few months as we negotiate. Cool. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. David? Dave? Thanks. Um, Thanks, Mark, and also congratulations on how the, the upstairs part of the terminal is working at the moment. I think it's really good, and you're quite right with that comment in there about it being a destination cafe and, and place for pe 
kids to be taken for visits and all sorts of things like that. And that's sort of an attractive place to go to now. Thank you. Um, look, I had a couple of questions to start with about um, destinations from Hamilton, on flights from Hamilton. The issue with the flights from to Auckland being canned last year, I'm hearing some anecdotal evidence now that Hamilton, the Waikato people are now flying in some cases to Wellington and Christchurch to catch international flights because the travel time is so unreliable and the parking costs so high at Auckland Airport. Are you hearing that or is there any movement in that area of potentially ever bringing back the flights to Auckland? I think your first question, Dave, around, uh, I think the the travel to Wellington or Christchurch, particularly to, to catch trans-Tasman international flights, there is evidence of that. And, and certainly we would be promoting that as, as an airport company uh, because people often don't think to, to fly south, to fly west, and in fact it may be more efficient time-wise to do that. Uh, uh, than, to than to drive to Auckland to fly. So I think we'll see more evidence of that. Um, and certainly the congestion, and you, you will have seen perhaps Matt, that I've been reported around congestion comments recently, and there's no question that getting to Auckland Airport is problematic at times. And that does, and, that, and, and some of our passenger growth, we are certainly putting down to that fact. Um, a Hamilton Auckland service, I think we'll continue to look at it. We did look at it closely with um, Auckland Airport last year, uh, and Auckland Airport had very sophisticated modelling, uh, and really the business case at that point didn't stack up to take certainly to Air New Zealand. Uh, so it remains a work in progress. Um, we're all well aware of the huge increase in traffic between Tauranga and, um, and Auckland. Uh, and look, Generally, the two-hour the two-hour mindset, the two-hour distance, is considered the the point at which um, you will drive over flying. Arguably, now it's no longer an hour and a half drive from Hamilton to Auckland. Be three or four. Something. So um, I think it's I think it's an evolving story, uh, and I think as we get more and more passenger growth, you know, we have more and more opportunities to leverage. Uh, and whether or not that's with an New Zealand or, or, an, or another carrier, indeed, a smaller uh, uh, regional carrier. Um, but uh, often you need, if you're flying Hamilton to Auckland, you need the opportunity of interlining of uh, international onward travel, which limits uh, carriers outside of, of international, your Air New Zealand perhaps, or Jetstar carriers. Yeah, yeah. The other route that I wanted to mention was Palmerston North, as far as I can see, I mean, it's it's a very good route if it's if you want to go there on weekdays, but it's not. It doesn't seem to be available on weekends. Certainly on weekends, that twice when I've tried, it was impossible. It is impossible because they, 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 they are, there are not services, and I guess that's a, a direct correlation to the loadings that in New Zealand were getting on those weekend services. So. Um, look, uh, Palmerston North has, has, is performing much better than it was, mm. but it's still um, uh, at roughly 75, 76% loading, still uh, well below what the air airline would be looking for, which is normally in excess of 80%. Um, so, um, has it lifted since they made the Palmerston thing a connection to Wales? Absolutely. Yes, it has. Yeah. Um, but the Palmerston North, and if you combine Palmerston North and Wellington, those those routes are growing at about 7%. So Palmerston North is getting some growth again, uh, and particularly strong midweek, of course. Um, uh, the services, as we know, the university, the agribusinesses, et cetera. Um, but there isn't a huge demand for, for that leisure component in the weekend. Right. The, the question that Mark um, here asked before about the Air New Zealand uh, maintenance crew leaving, basically, in future when there's an aircraft malfunction, are they going to be in a position of having to drive someone or a crew down from Auckland to do um, urgent maintenance work? A absolutely. That, that, that becomes the risk for Air New Zealand, that they're going to have to um, do exactly that. And that's going to be the situation everywhere except Nelson, Wellington, Christchurch, Auckland. Pretty much. And look, I, I have to say that, uh, you know, um, it's very seldom that we see an aircraft out of service for engineering 
uh, you know, for urgent engineering requirements. They tend, you know, they, um, in Hamilton, it happens where, you know, the flight is, is out of service in Dunedin or Wellington or wherever and, and is delayed as a result or the flight cancelled. But yeah, that's the reality. Uh, it's very much a hub and spoke um, strategy for the airline, not only for passengers but for, for aircraft maintenance. Okay. Well, the last one related yeah. to public transport to the airport. I'm aware on the Regional Council's Public Transport Committee, we're now talking about um, the bus service that go from Hamilton to Te Awamutu, uh, some of them at least diverting via the terminal, passenger terminal. Is that something you're encouraging or have been involved in those discussions yet? Because there is no public transport unless you can have taxis. No, there isn't, and it's not It's not a discussion um, that that we have been involved in, and, and I'll certainly follow that up. OK, yeah. you'd, you'd be interested in supporting... Oh, look, I think if there's an opportunity... Um, I mean, obviously we'd like people to park at the airport, um, yeah. but, uh, but the key for us is that we have people flying in and out of the airport. Yeah. Yep. Okay, thanks. <coughs> thanks, Dave. Uh, Jeff? Thanks, Gary. Uh, yeah, look, I want to reiterate what Dave was saying about the um, the appearance of the terminal. Congratulations on the work you, do, you guys are doing, Mark and Annabelle. I, uh, I had my parents over uh, Thursday or Friday from Tauranga, and they came to Hamilton to fly to Palmerston North, and they just couldn't believe the contrast between our airport and Tauranga's and I was able to remind them that they were in the city of the future now, and uh, very, I was very proud to show it off. Um, can you just take me through the work on reviewing the primary entrance for the airport um, that, that's going on there at the moment? Sure. So, look, I, I don't think I have a map to show you, but if you um, currently uh, the intention is that when certain traffic generators are hit, that uh, we have a requirement to put in a roundabout on State Highway 21. At the moment, um, that is designated up opposite Lockheel Road, the golf course, and into the into the Titanium Park and down to the terminal internally. Um, our view, uh, since we dissolved the joint venture, our view is that principally, you know, our business is, is the airport, uh, and and the and our property activity is secondary to to that. So. Our view was that we'd much rather have the roundabout back down by the main entry uh, to the airport that would facilitate the requirements of NZTA in terms of traffic generation, but allows us to better utilise and create a better presence into the airport and to develop that. So it's an entranceway slightly to the north of where it currently is, about 100 metres to the north. It would also allow then direct access into what's called Gate Zero into Mystery Creek, um, which is between the Gun Club and the Cart Club, for those of you that know the area well. So that would all line up and be a much, a much better um, entry point. Right, and in terms of timing and processes? Look, the, the, the actual triggers for that round, of, um, we'd like them as, we're not in a hurry for those triggers because there is an, ex, uh, the, the cost sharing model at the moment uh, places that cost on, on TPL and RAL, on, on, on the RAL group. Um, but about 20, late 20s, 2028 20, to 2030, um, some of that modelling is dependent on, on when and if Southern Lynx mm. is completed and what that does to the State Highway 321 Waikato Expressway traffic movement as well. So NZTA and their latest modelling supported by our consultants suggest a bit of a bell curve of activity. So we'll see it rise as, as our park develops, as the airport grows, uh, and then we see those vehicle movements drop back down again as Southern Lynx comes on stream. So it is a bit of a moving target, although we're likely to redevelop the internal road and an inter and an internal roundabout prior to the main external state highway roundabout. And that, that could happen certainly within the next um, three to five years, so that we can reorganise the car park, we can reorganise the entry to the airport. Okay, thank you. Thanks, mate. Thanks, Jeff. James. <coughs> Thanks, uh, Mark Mandible, for the presentation. Really good. Just uh, one question. You know, we'd, we'd all love to see uh, international flights return to the Waikato, but with international flights, it means um, you know, bigger planes and um, improvements to runway. My question is, um, 
The, the land sales you're doing, would that affect any future development at the airport for runway extensions? No, it doesn't. So the, the, the key strategy around future-proofing the airport is, is, the, is the sacrosanct document. So we have a, a master plan uh, which, <coughs> which protects the aeronautical land required for any airport extension. Uh, and Titanium Park uh, was always designed, f if you like, for f land that was surplus to any aeronautical future-proofing. Cool, thanks. Thanks, James. Uh, Paula. Quite a few of my questions have been struck off now. I already asked about the passenger transport was one of them, um, and um, the voting improvements are linked to Southern Links, which you've kind of um, um, answered now. Uh, the residual question around that transport is, um, with your opportunity to do master planning for the farm, is there any thoughts to re-diverting some of the field days? access because that's the one time of year when it is problematic to get to the airport. Sorry, Paula, I'm not entirely sure. Where would you, the, with the, the, when, given that, that when field days is on, yes. you have to allow an extra 40 minutes or more yep. to get to the airport, what, what um, opportunities are there within... Well, look, I think the, ultimately the development of the farm, of course, is on the other side of yeah, the airport, so it does take away yeah. um, ultimately... Some of that um, pressure on State Highway 21 and 21. field mm. days entry, and and look, we've been working very closely with um, with uh, field days uh, around the Sydney. The roundabout mm. uh, would be very helpful because it would it would allow uh, to run during field days a double ring road, um, which would Cut certainly alleviate... Right, right turns in and out. Yep, yeah. certainly alleviate that traffic congestion. But look, I don't think you're ever going to... Uh, uh, I think what we're doing on the on the farm, uh, or, and indeed what we're doing on the central and southern precinct, I, I think our vehicle activity versus field days is just... It's one of those yeah, things. It's just one of those things. It's very small, and I think you're always going to have this mm. stress of, a, of an event where you're bringing hundreds of thousands of people mm. in over a three, four day event. Just don't think you can avoid it. And then uh, just one more question around the, you, the map you put up before and um, the developments, the southern developments, the industrial areas there that you can bring on stream. Um, any work done around reverse sensitivity or is that still going to be a bit of an issue in, in terms of landowners adjacent to the airport developments? I think it actually supports the reverse sensitivity because it's commercial um, and it's not impacted by... I mean, most of the reverse sensitivity issues are as a result of residential. Mm. Uh, and there's no question, actually, and it's, it's probably an appropriate time to raise it, that we, are, that we have had a significant um, lift in concerns by neighbours um, uh, over the summer with the amount of flight activity, uh, which has been significant because the weather has been relatively good. And we've had quite a different wind pattern, which has meant that um, certainly lots of our Tamahiri residents um, are unhappy with the, with the flight activity. Uh, so we're very, and you know, so we're working very closely with WIPA on those issues. But I think that mm. commercial and commercial development certainly minimises that reverse sensitivity. So it creates that bigger buffer. You're yep. saying, yeah. Yep. Actually, I didn't know that about Tamahiri, but you do. I do recall in the, earlier when the development was mooted that um, sorry, um, that um, uh, that there were issues with adjacent landowners around what was proposed and flight Look, paths I, and things. I think our land, uh, the, the, our neighbours are very comfortable. In fact, we've consulted with all of our neighbours in relation to the private plan change and the change of access, and there is not one. Uh, uh, there, are, there are one or two concerns around. Uh, entry and, and how that affects their, their um, entry exit points, but in essence, full support from our neighbours from Lockheel Road all the way through. Um, mm. the, the concern, of course, is for residential north and west of the mm. airport, mm. Uh, and an airport. Uh, it's, it's, it's a challenge for the airport because you know we obviously want aircraft to fly in and out of the uh, airport. Yeah, yeah, and it's. A I just flag that it's also a concern for the city in their development, how they place their developments and the expectations in residential areas, isn't it, when you've got flight paths and things like yes. that. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Martin, thanks. Yeah, that's a very interesting topic. Sure.
Well, I just wanted to be sorry to be, and to be totally respectful. We're running a pretty tight. No, no, no. I'm, I'm just picking um, up the the yeah, flight movements. Mark's been waiting for a long, long time. And flight, not this mark. The last sure. next mark. <laughs> the, the flight the flight movements in terms of you know it was a rural airport predicated on being surrounded by rural rural mm. communities, not yeah. urban communities. Uh, presumably, the all the um, plans that you have in terms of your authority to operate are covered by that. Absolutely. So we, we, we obviously have a noise management plan within the district plan. Uh, we have noise monitoring equipment on airport. Sure. So uh, yes, we, are, we, are, we know exactly uh, where we are in terms of our statutory obligations. Well, it's a reasonable, what I call it, it's a pushback. So if you choose to build a multi-million dollar mansion near the airport, the airport was there first. You've said that. I Thank you. <laughs> no, no, I, I'm crystal. That, I mean, this is a 30-year-old discussion. Right? Yes. And this, this very issue was predicted um, back then when Waikato, course, did all their interesting um, plans in that area. Just the other thing, it was interesting that Taronga was mentioned. Uh, and I, just a quick question. Obviously, um, I'm sure Councillor Taylor, Taronga is now engaging a significant upgrade, I read, you know, to their terminal. Is there sort of any potential competitions kind of matter area? You know, I mean, in terms of the Rotorua Tauranga Hamilton, where are the kind of boundaries, or, or, or does their activities have any impact whatsoever on you? I, I think that's a good point. I think there is some mm. merging now. Um, yeah. Certainly uh, less, I think, between Rotorua and or mm. Tauranga and, mm. and, and Hamilton. Mm. But certainly, uh, you know, if you're living uh, midway between mm. um, Tauranga and Hamilton, then you do have choice in terms of where you mm. fly from. So I think there is some um, emerging. It's always mm. been there anyway, and sure. I think it's just perhaps uh, you know some cu some customers will decide based on schedule sure. and flight availability. Which leads me to my final question. Just coming back to the Auckland Hamilton. So like you know, obviously the fantastic non-stop you know Christchurch hubs out to the rest of the South Island. Family of four or five travelling, and you can get the cheap you know cheapy deals with Jetstar Air New Zealand via Auckland. Do you have a worry that um, you, 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 you will lose, you know, always you're going to lose a certain degree of customers because of the structure of the airfares that come out of Auckland to Christchurch versus Hamilton to Christchurch? Look, interestingly, uh, and we're putting this information on uh, Facebook uh, and Instagram for, the, for this particular reason, the, the really fare differential, thing, you? <laughs> you'd be surprised, <laughs> Gary, we had 27,000 last Good. month. Well done. Um, <laughs> But uh, the fair differential between Hamilton and Christchurch and Hamilton Wellington versus Auckland Christchurch and Auckland and peak hour flights is now about twenty dollars on average. Mm. I mean and so, the economy of petrol wear and tear going to Auckland. Yep. You know, I and obviously I'm just wondering if you're really trying to, dare I say it, educate your consumer in terms of savings versus mythical savings? Well, we absolutely mm. are. And mm. uh, look, we're about to... Um, and, and those fare differentials have shortened significantly. So now we're, we're stressing to everyone any opportunity to go and check because once... Uh, certainly if you're onward travel to Queenstown or Dunedin or Invercargill, there is a challenge out of Hamilton mm. for a fair compatibility, but not to Wellington and Christchurch. And should... Um, negotiations with another major national carrier ever be a fruit, you will confidentially, obviously, inform us as a 50% shareholder. We always talk to our 50% shareholder, shareholder first. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Martin. Siggy. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for your report. Look, um, a couple of things, and I, I just read, and I'm, I, I'm just trying to find it, but I can't find it at the moment. It was about the, the, the toxic foam for the uh, fire um, fighting, and I know you don't need it that much, but I just read that, is it right, Auckland has still got a, a huge amount of that toxic foam, and, and, and there's a process of changing into a less toxic form. Is that right? The EPA is working on that? Was So yes, are, yes. are we in that... Are we doing something about that too here in Hamilton? We absolutely are. So this, is, this issue has been picked up by the Airport Association. It was first found in Nelson that we're using um, uh, PFO, uh, so the elements of PFAS and, and PFOS within the foam was identified in Nelson. They were using a product that, was, that should not have been used. So all product post-2008 uh, is generally safe. Although, as I'm understanding more about this issue, that uh, this, this 
is in everything. It's in shoes, it's in um, mm. glassware. It's, so it's not um, just in foam. What I can say is that the foam that Hamilton Airport uses, um, uh, all bar 200 litres, was purchased after 2008, 2009. Um, we're currently having all of our um, foam tested mm -hmm. uh, by Becker, and we expect those reports uh, in the next two weeks. EPA have advised that the foams we use are foams that they're not, at this point, are not interested in, okay. but they would like the results of, of our testing. So we uh, apply at the moment, um, and we don't require an exemption. Okay. Oh, that's good to know. The other question I have, and, and that just came out of Treffens last year, that there's a, there's a, um, we saw some electric planes that are used in Germany, or, well, not not yet commercially used, but being built to be commercially used. I mean, are they quieter than, would they be quieter? <laughs> <laughs> would Tamahiri residents be happy about that? Just well, a question. They, they may Not well be, but, I, but, I, but I, I feel it's it's a long way into the future, isn't it? Okay. Um, so, uh, so look, I, no, look, I can't comment. I don't know anything about it. Um, okay. Uh, it just looked like it was coming or they developing it. We don't know how fast they will come, of course, yeah. yeah. Thank you, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, we have no more uh, questions. I'll move the staff recommendation on page 34. Uh, uh, seconded by, uh, so Mallet, Gallagher, uh, any debate? Martin. Because I know time is precious, but um, obviously congratulate the airport company and uh, dare I say it, note, um, this is not a throwaway comment, note the quality of your governance in terms of the people who sit around the director's table. I think this has been a very proactive report and it's really good to, to see the airport company, you know, going into, into a multi-year, particularly around, you know, property investment, um, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously uh, it's also a given, um, and obviously I think for many of us just as ordinary users, uh, the terminal, the local, this point of a really lovely, great facility for, for what it is, you know, obviously is a major region airport. The only observation I'd make is, is we look with some interest in terms of ministerial comments around Air New Zealand, but Air New Zealand is, of course, a business, and just as the airport company is a business, and, of course, confidentially, we are obviously pleased that the airport company will be always looking for opportunity for other carriers to, to come in, uh, so to speak. Uh, is it fair to say that, um, and it's also a given that when we discuss a statement of intent, uh, obviously there's nothing in the statement of intent that is commercially sensitive, because note this has all been in public discussion. It's a given that obviously if there was something that's of commercial sensitivity, as I said before, we'd expect as a shareholder to have you at the other end of the table. But if you could congratulate um, your team and governance, I think this is a excellent report and, and I think with respect, the RAL, W-R-A-L, in terms of its multifaceted business is in very good hands. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Uh, Andrew. Yeah, um, <coughs> half a million passengers from our region are driving right past Hamilton Airport to get to Auckland and this, as we know, is called congestion both at Auckland Airport and on the road getting to Auckland Airport. Um, I, I believe Air New Zealand do a fantastic job for the regions as well as the big cities, um, and particularly as we've heard with fair, di fair differentials between Hamilton, Wellington and Christchurch. Um, but I think for the overall efficiencies of the transport network, it would be great to have a plane flying between Hamilton and Auckland regularly. Uh, it would just take a lot of pressure off the whole network right or right the way through both both Auckland and and the roads. Um, I'd like to congratulate the board. You've done a fantastic job in turning around the airport <coughs> from where it was a few years ago. Um, you've future proofed by far, buying the farm on the other side and sold a bit of land on our side to pay for most of it, so that's very clever. And you're in control. Um, you're in a position to extend the runway when the time's right. And I think that, that will present itself in the fullness of time. And, yeah, just... Um, I, I actually believe that Hamilton Airport is the second airport for the region, for the Auckland Waikato 
region. And of course, uh, Auckland Airport won't like that to even ever be considered, but it's the reality of the future. But I see, uh, I see um, Hamilton Airport as a ghost, as a, as a goose that lays the golden egg. It's just not old enough to lay those eggs yet. But it will come of age. It will come, and I just urge this council, because some of you will be here for many decades to come, just to remember when the offer comes to sell the shares in this airport, don't let them go. It's the one thing that I believe long term will subsidise rates for our city. We own 50% of that airport. And it is one asset that I'm very happy that we own. It's one asset that I would hate to see ever sold in the future. It's um, huge, it will be a will subsidise rates and it's probably the only thing that we've got long term pay its way as Auckland Airport does for Auckland ratepayers. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Um, Mark. Thank you. Um, look, just to follow on from that, um, <clears throat> my 10-year-old son, Max, would absolutely have my hide if we got rid of anything that looked like the airport because it is our major destination. It's a hangout. We go out there all the flipping time. I just about need my car park out there. It's incredible, and I'd like to thank me for contributing to your Can you pop that into your statement of intent, coffers. Mark? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, perhaps it's almost a uh, conflict mm -hmm. of interest. Almost. Um, but, yeah, no, great job. That is uh, what these guys said about the uh, the destination. You've done what you can. I mean, yeah, Andrew, you're right. Um, 500,000 people do go past that place, but there's only a certain amount these guys can do about that, because it's ultimately they're the landlords. Um, it's, it is an Air New Zealand decision, and if it was economically viable, they would be flying, you know, every 10 minutes up to, to Auckland. I, you know, and it's interesting watching the market play out. I think, you know, perhaps Chatham Air or a smaller operator may pick that up if it becomes viable, and I look forward to watching that. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd be very keen to keep my eye on the engineering situation, um, having uh, been in a couple of flights that have been delayed because of engineering issues. Now the rules have changed in the aviation industry, which obviously you'll know about, where even a, an air hostess can't even adjust a loose bolt in a, in a, in, in a plane without calling an engineer in. So how that's going to play out will be really interesting because um, they had to fly one from Auckland last time, or get one down from Auckland last time. So I'll be, I'll be really interested to watch that, and I'll be, um, uh, I'll, I'll be expecting them back in there, actually, you know, uh, sometime shortly. But... You know, I'm no crystal ball gazer, but look, bottom line is, great spot. You've done a really cool job. It wasn't so long ago we were looking at their reports saying what a disaster it was uh, with the property. And so congratulations to you and John and the team, the board, on that really good, stable, bringing it back to what it is um, attitude. So well done. Thank you. Thank you, and I'll just echo the comments and compliments you've received today. They well well earned. Um, I'll put the uh, resolution recommendation to the vote. Those Sorry. Uh, those in favour, please say aye. aye. Is there anyone against? Okay, move unanimously. Thank you. Okay, I suggest we have uh, we have Mark Butcher here, who's been waiting really patiently. I'm sorry, Mark. Can we just have a toilet break and be back at five to twelve? So um, we just I just know I know I know you're all starving and that sort of stuff, but <clears throat> hopefully we can get through Mark's. Um, presentation and then we can have lunch sort of 12 30 ish would be the aim thank you so if we could be back by 12. <clears throat>
It was quantitative, not qualitative. Um, okay, so we're on item. We're on item. Local government funding agency, uh, page number 104 in our agenda. Mark, thank you very much for your patience. I apologise and appreciate you hanging around. Um, if you'd like to, uh, is there anyone else going to be sitting next to you? No. no? You're right? I'll support him. That's right. <laughs> no, that's fine. Okay. okay, Mark, thank, thank you. you. So, Mark's the CEO of um, Local Government Funding Agency. Authority. Authority? Agency. Doesn't agency. We've got an though. error in our. I thought Sorry. it was agency. Yeah. Sorry. Good. <laughs> Floor's yours, Mark. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Look, um, just us out front low, um, no no issues at all with, with actually hanging around as, as you put it. Um, it's really important for us to, to be here and to actually listen in as well to on the debate and the discussion that actually takes place as well. Um, we also do appreciate the support of the council. Uh, you are the second largest shareholder uh, in our GFA after the, after the Crown. Uh, you're our sixth largest borrower. Uh, and also you're a fourth largest guarantor. So, um, you know, our GFA wouldn't be here today uh, for 54 councils as it wasn't for um, Hamilton City being one of the original Type 9 uh, councils who actually did get the agency um, up and running. So um, and it's important, as I said, as being uh, a lender to councils um, that we do turn up um, at least once a year, if not twice a year, uh, to talk to councils as well too, um, you're a guarantor, and so we have to um, protect your position um, as guarantors as well too. So, um, so look, please um, don't do not apologise. Um, uh, so, so there's two things today. One is the half yearly report, and one is the statement of intent. Uh, the half yearly report you've got for the six months to December. The agency's going um, really well. It's going according to plan. Uh, the net operating gain or the profit was up 13% on the prior period, so around about $6 million for the six-month period, uh, forecast uh, just slightly above the forecast. Um, so uh, revenue was slightly higher, expenses were slightly lower than, than forecast. Uh, we're still on track to deliver the full-year uh, profitability of around about $10.8 million. Uh, assets are around about $8.1 billion. Um, in terms of our borrowing for the six months, uh, we have borrowed approximately and lent approximately around about $600 million to councils. Uh, that was in line with um, what we were um, expecting to do. Uh, we had one new council join, uh, Rangatiki, uh, but we've got about six, between six and ten are about to join, probably in the months. We're seeing uh, a number of councils as they go through the LTP process, uh, realising that either A, their debt levels are increasing, um, or secondly, if their debt levels aren't increasing, then the benefits of joining our GFA are actually growing for them um, as the bank fees continue to actually increase. So, um, so that's actually positive. So we will be up close to 60, maybe even as high as 64 councils uh, out of 78. Uh, within the next nine months, so that's um, so that's very pleasing. Uh, from a a, uh, a guarantor's point of view, uh, putting on your guarantor hat or representing you as guarantors, uh, the credit quality uh, continues to improve, uh, so that's actually very pleasing. Uh, all councils remain compliant with our financial covenants uh, within the six-month period. Uh, the big piece of work for us at the moment is obviously currently assessing the LTPs or the draft LTPs as they come out. Uh, but what we're seeing is that all councils to date are certainly forecasting to remain compliant with the um, LTPs um, going forward and with, with our covenants. So that's just on the half year of the report. Do you want me to just to briefly touch on the SOI? Could I just, okay, thanks for breaking down like that. I've just got a couple of questions. Um, Paul has got one, uh, some too. Um, on, on, on page 108 of our agenda, yes. which, are, which is page four of your report, so it's um, yes. it. the Chair's report, um, said uh, interest has increased by about, four, four, interest income has increased by about uh, 14%. Yes. Just from a simple point of view, um, that your, your interest income, not your, not your margin at the bottom, but your interest income increases for two reasons. Either the interest rates go up 
or you're lending more. Which was it, or is it a bit of both? Am I right? Uh, yep. So it wasn't. Yeah. So uh, yeah, in interest rates were risen slightly uh, from a year ago. Not much. Yeah. Uh, what that is is um, the fact that we have increased our liquid assets portfolio. So we have a have an investment portfolio. Yeah. Uh, which we need for liquidity perspective, and so that. Sorry. Does it, does the investment portfolio is your assets are our loans? Yes, but we've also then got another 350 or $400 million of liquid assets. So they are investments with banks. We own some government stock. Oh, okay. uh, and so that has grown over the last six months because we have, in a year's time, we have um, close to uh, 1.1 billion of loans maturing to councils, and we have 1.1 billion of bonds that need to be refinanced. Refinance. So okay. we have to increase our liquidity going into these maturity dates because Hamilton City Council may come may well come through and refinance its loans early. We then have to go out and borrow some money, but there's a gap in between. So naturally, our, our liquidity requirements increase. It's kind of a buffer, isn't it? And yes, and we get a return on that liquidity buffer. So that, okay. that's the reason for why it's slightly higher. That's that's enough to give you a fourteen percent increase in income. In uh, well, yes. rough, I'm, and that's not all of it, obviously, but that's primarily what's caused that. Um, no, plus also um, in that period as well too. What was happening was that uh, councils were also did not wait until December two thousand and seventeen to refinance all their December two thousand seventeen loans. They were doing it up to a year in advance. And it did see in the uh, in the throughout 2017, uh, councils would borrow from us to, to refinance their loans, but they would then put their money on term deposit. And as a result of that, we had extra loans outstanding to councils, which were then going to run off at maturity date. Okay, so. thank you. Um, I just congratulate you. You're, uh, I mean, you, you seem to be growing and you seem also to be able to keep your um, operating expenses under control. Yes, it's a scale business. So it's I mean, a, it's a scale business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's uh, we're close to eight billion dollars of assets, and we've only still got six people. Yeah. So six staff. Fantastic. Yes. Thank you. And uh, third, I just noticed that uh, city council our, our loans have dropped from three hundred and fifty one to two hundred and eighty six, um, which kind of re reflect you know. Refer, hmm. Agrees with what our figures are. You somewhere I did read that there was I don't know if the word is right, but there was a suggestion that councils will there will be lower demand for council borrowing because of the HIF, which is. Um, uh, do you see that having a big impact on your business? No. So so there's two uncertainties for us, which is also in the statement of intent. Uh, on the one side, what's still playing out is central government assistance to the sector either in terms of the HIF or in terms of Crown Infrastructure Partners, some of the new SPV vehicles. So we still do not know yet if, the, if that arrangements are going to uh, complement our GFA lending, so there will be projects on top of what councils would normally borrow for, or are they going to be a substitute, substitute for yeah. our GFA lending. So that's still yet to play out. Then on the other side of it, the positive side is that with the LTPs coming out, uh, I would say nearly every council would be looking at increasing its borrowing uh, because it needs to do infrastructure investment, particularly around water. So, but we still haven't seen all the draft LTPs, and there's always, as you know, there's always uncertainty around when the timing of that borrowing actually takes place. So we're in a little bit. Of, we're in the middle. We have, you know, 85 to 95 percent market share of all council <coughs> borrowing. We have to wait for the councils to tell us exactly how much they want to borrow. We can then go out and issue. So we don't have a lot of control over the council's borrowing activities. So we, we, we have to wait. So that's why we have said, based on our modelling, we expect um, no change in the LGFA balance sheet for the next two years. We're not sure in year three because it's so far out. Okay. And the debt to revenue ratio. Um which is a benchmark. Do you, is that, are we conforming to your benchmark? Uh, are you, you the guys who lead that? So, 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 so we have our own financial covenants. They are slightly different to what you've got, but you're certainly remaining well compliant to our financial covenants. So what's your 
So, so, so we just have a slightly different measure of debt to revenue than what than what you do. Um, do you is that because you identify debt differently and or identify income differently? It's revenue? more the revenue side that, okay. that we have a slightly different measure. Um, but were you I, here when we had the yes? You were. So things like development contributions and invested assets and etc. What what's your view on those as being included as uh, in revenue? So we don't include them. Okay. Uh, because we believe they're too difficult to forecast. Uh, the non-recurring revenue as well too. Um, so we try to make our financial covenants as simple and concise as possible as we have to apply them across all 54 council borrowers. Mm -hmm. So we take a very simplistic approach. Um, but we're comfortable with your debt to revenue calculations uh, and your your debt limits are consistent with our debt limits as to how we measure you against our own debt limits. You're not we, alone. We, Other councils also have slightly different yep. uh, measurements relative to the LGFA covenants, yep. um, and the rating agencies also uh, have slightly different financial covenants. But at the end of the day, if you breach your, your own metrics, you'll be breaching LGFA metrics, you'll be breaching rating agencies' metrics. So. So long as they're all relatively consistent, which is, in our opinion, they are, then it doesn't matter. And we're going to move to these. Yeah, and I think David reminds me that we are moving very close to... We're going to the 230. Is that what you're talking about? No, the, the actual way the LGFA calculates the debt to revenue. We're oh, moving okay. to that yes. in the proposed 10-year plan. So that is part of our Correct. part of our financial strategy within the 10-year plan. Yes, yeah, okay. to align. Thank you. Apologies, just, uh, I was just reminding the Chair that through the 10-year plan process we're proposing to adopt the LGFA um, measurement or calculation of the debt to revenue so that there's no uncertainty or difference between those two measures. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Paula. Thank you. Just a, there were a couple of quick straightforward ones. In terms of, um, you've got 64, you hope to have 64 out of the 78 councils in the next short while? Yes. Um, so it kind of made my um, question maybe redundant. I was just wondering, are, the, are all of the metros in? The only two metros aren't are Dunedin and Invercargill. Mm. And and so you're getting good to uptake from all the provincial, rural? Yes. Yes. <coughs> Largely, okay. Um, I was just wondering also, and I think you may have touched on it, the range of assets that people are borrowing for. Is it large, largely water? Um, are there, what other kind of, are, they, are any of them borrowing for like community assets? I don't know, theatres, pools, those sorts of things? We are all for water, roading, housing infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, we don't pass judgment. On the on what the loan proceeds are going to be used for, obviously mm. that gets uh, uh, completed through the LTP and the, and the annual plan process. So we won't pass judgment on um, we won't withhold a loan if we don't think that they should be building a swimming pool. Um, but you, you look to a business case behind that in the LTP, wouldn't you? Yes, yeah. correct. And that's so if they've got a sound business case, you, you could loan on it. Um, thank you, that's interesting. And I was just interested in the council debt thresholds. You were talking about your measure, which was really useful information. Um, do you uh, follow the debt trends of various councils in terms of um, understanding where the sector's going? Because would it, would it be fair to say that councils are moving into more debt at this period of time because of growth and because of pressures with water and things? Yes, so so we, we have a very extensive database. We do track it. Obviously, you know, we have got $7.6 billion of loans out to council, so we're following the sector very closely. Mm. Um, what we've seen, and it will continue, I think, as well, is that the, uh, the metro councils will continue to borrow more relative to the provincial and rural councils uh, mm. going forward in the LTPs, and that's just uh, a natural mm. progression of you know, population a movement scale and economy. for infrastructure. Mm. Mm. Uh, that's what, but having said that, we'd also though, expect provincial and rural councils to also being under slightly more pressure around water infrastructure. I was gonna, that was going to be my next question. Given the, what I know about the pressures in, um, happening in water, a lot of the smaller councils have found themselves unprepared for the 
um, big standards that they now have to reach, haven't they? <coughs> Uh, okay, thank you. And the special pers purpose vehicles you already touched on, so thank you. Thanks, Paula. Leo. <coughs> have Excuse Auckland um, pulled out from the LGFA, have they? No. Uh, so, no. Um, Auckland's still our largest uh, borrower. We've got... But uh, I noticed that they're borrowing offshore now, is that correct? Correct. So... They must be getting a better deal. So, so Auckland have got a very large debt requirement. We cap them at 40% oh, okay. of our balance sheet. So they, they can never uh, borrow at this stage more than $3, $3 billion from our GFA. Uh, so as a result, they've currently got, I think it's two point two point one billion or, or, or just over $2 billion. So they have to borrow from some other sources. Once uh, they hit that ceiling. Yes. Okay. Correct. So, that, so that, that's why. Okay. I don't suppose you know the interest rate that they would be borrowing at overseas? Well, you're not prepared to tell us, are you? Oh, look, look, look it's, it, it's well known that um, you, you can borrow more cheaply in New Zealand, but Auckland's position is that they are so large they cannot borrow fully in New Zealand, so they have to... And, and, they, and they, like any other borrower, take a portfolio approach to it. They will have some cheaper funding, they will have some more expensive funding, they will have some short-term funding, some long-term funding. End of the day, it gets blended up into your, such as yourself, your average cost of borrowing is 5%. I think their average cost of borrowing is around about 5% as well too. So you shouldn't go too micro and look at every single loan transaction because they've got such a large amount of debt. Thanks, Leo. Uh, Ryan. Um, I just wanted to pick up on the point that Dave made with the council's going to match or mirror phase debt to revenue ratio. What's the current gap there in terms of dollar value? Just in case you get an extra sneaky 10 mil in there or something like that. No, well, probably the best way to answer it is page 60 of our agenda, which talks about both uh, uh, the current Hamlin City Council debt to revenue ratio. It's currently ratio is at 170 per cent. So in other words, um, we're borrowing um, 100 per cent of our uh, revenue, 100 per cent, 70 per cent of debt. Um, but just underneath that is the LGFA calculation, which is at 147 per cent. So that just means that um, our debt is only 147, 147 per cent of our revenue. Right, but if we're going to take it up to 230 or 238 using their revenue, technically that's going to mean we've got a greater dollar value of debt, doesn't it, using correct. their ratio? That's correct. It'll, it'll, it'll mean that we will be able to borrow more. Okay. That's just, I think, something I just want to be wary of because that's... Sure. Um, you know, in terms of keeping names sake, where debt to revenue ratio stays the same, but are actually we're sneaking in more funds borrowed. So, yeah, I'm just a bit wary about that. Well, it's just, uh, it's about the whole picture in terms of the variables for the long-term plan and, and meet, meet that 230 debt covenant. In the, in the long-term plan that you address that debt-to-revenue ratio, are you referring to council's debt-to-revenue or this debt-to-revenue? Long-term plan refers to the proposed, yep. which is the LGFA um, calculation. The, the principal reason for changing wasn't necessarily to open up access to more debt. It was about understanding. 230 was our limit that we didn't want to breach, and that that 230 limit is a limit that the LGFA said because they are our principal <coughs> funders. Right. So, so it just didn't make sense to have a calculation that was not in line with the 230 limit that we were wanting to um, use as a as a if you like a limit for yep. for borrowing. So it's, it has a lot of sense in terms of aligning the calculation for our debt to revenue with the actual funder that we're borrowing the money from. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, Andrew. If we were borrowing from you as we are instead of traditional banking services in New Zealand, what would be the difference in interest rate? So we calculate that and we, we publish that um, every quarter. We think it's somewhere between 0.15 and 0.3% per annum, uh, depending upon the term of the of the debt, so on your 300 million approximately, uh, we're saving or you're saving six. 
$600,000 a year, I think it is. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Are there any more questions? All right. I will move the recommend staff recommendation on page 104 that we receive the report and approve the local government funding authority. Not authority. Agency. What is? Oh, are you seconding? Agency. Oh, sorry. Agency. Uh, draft statement of intent uh, for 2018-19. Uh, Mallet, Cassins. Those. In uh, is there anyone against? Okay, unanimous. Thank you. Thanks very much. Oh, sorry. Cassin. Yeah. Cassin. <laughs> <Your Cousin>. <laughs> like croutons. Thanks, Mark. Uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you. Okay, we're moving on to. Hmm? Oh, do you want to go? Oh, that's what we were too, weren't we? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's now. Okay, how about we're back here at quarter. Uh, 12 1 o'clock? Mm hmm? Oh, okay, is everyone happy? Well, I did say that. We'll keep going. Okay, 10 year. Which is item 9, page 52 on your agenda, in your agendas. <clears throat> okay, Russell. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to present you with the 10 year monitoring report for the eight months ended February 2018. Um, it starts on page 52 of your agenda. Shows a year to date accounting surplus of $40 million. This is 34.8 million favourable to our year to date budget. Compares to December position using the same measure of 22.6 million. The items that largely contributed to this favourable variance are vested assets revenue, which were 21 million over budget, revenue from capital projects and development contributions, collectively were 11.1 million over budget, and higher revenue from user charges of 2.4 million. Um, there are other smaller variances, obviously, and they can be found on page 54 of the agenda, um, with further full details in attachment one. I'm a little loath to start talking about councils balancing the books measure. Chicken. <laughs> but I will. Um, the <laughs> councils balancing the books measure for the um, period was a surplus of 14.7 million. This is 14.2 million favourable on the year to date budget, mainly due to capital revenue development contributions and higher revenue from user charges of 2.4 million. The local government balancing the books further eliminates revenue from development contributions and shows a deficit of 1.3 million. It was 5.7 million favourable to the year-to-date budget. The detail behind the balancing... Sorry, Russell, those yep. are a little bit different, not have been trying to be picky, that, to what's in our agenda. Is that because you've just rounded them? Uh, yes. Oh, OK. Um, the calculation of balancing books detail can be found on page 63 of the agenda. Oh, OK. Thank you. Sorry, I was looking at those ones here. <clears throat> page 55 to 56 of year-to-date capital expenditure. This is obviously a significant issue for us this year. The year-to-date spend on capital is 52.1 million, which is 7.6 million underspent compared to the year-to-date budget. Allowing for deferrals, approved risk and opportunities and budget forward, the revised capital expenditure program for the year is 136.9 million. And thus far we've got current deferrals, which reduce this to 117 million. What this means is that Council plans to spend 64.9 million in the next four months, or in the four months from the end of February through to the end of June. Capital expenditure detail of this is provided in attachment three and deferrals in attachment five. But needless to say, this is a significant um, plan. On page 58, we have the risks and opportunities schedule. 
The updates for February are the addition of the FMG Stadium air conditioning chiller of 710,000 and the Stadia light towers at FMG Stadium in Seddon Park, totalling 125,000. <coughs> we also are showing capital savings on the Far Western Interceptor and the new water mains at Rotokauri, totalling 1.75 million. In terms of debt, opportunity to talk about now. Council's total overall debt is 368.8 million. It's favourable on our year-to-date target by 64.8 million. Partially, or perhaps significantly, the effect of both the operating surplus or accounting surplus and the lack of capital expenditure. The HCC 12-month rolling debt to revenue ratio, which we currently use, shows us at a revenue at a ratio of 170%, which is below the annual target, which has been set at 205%. On page 61, we've provided further analysis of vested assets to show the estimated consequential annual depreciation cost. I know there was some discussion earlier about consequential costs. This shows us that of the 26.8 million to council, 15.3 million is land with no depreciation cost. The remaining 11.5 million has an estimated depreciation cost of less than $200,000 per year. At this point, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, <coughs> Russell. Page 54, paragraph 27, uh, and we've discussed this previously. Uh, what are the major contri contrib contributors to the massive increase in vested assets? Um, <clears throat> this increase, it's, I mean, it's huge against budget, but it's also huge just in the last two months from what we had last month. Uh, so page 54. Um, and it's major variances, uh, so it's paragraph 27. Major variances as at 20th, uh, 28 February 2018. Fourth one down, uh, one, two, three, fourth one down is higher revenue for invested assets, 21 million. Yes, yeah, so that 21 million is actually uh, a variance to budget. Yep. So the budget was 5.7. In total, we've actually received 26.7 million. Yep. Um, the big numbers in there come firstly from a pod of, of development around K Road. And we've discussed this just five minutes ago. Yep. You, you're a little bit concerned that there's some degree of confidentiality, so I don't expect you to breach that. But I, I think members would, I think, would quite like to know what the, or to, as much as we could, what are the actual projects that make that up? Because it's huge. Um, so, so again, it's about mainly the pods of, and the first big one is um, K Road. That's in Flagstaff, and the second one is. Um, the roundabout on White Eddy Drive, uh, do you know where the old Villa Dental is? Yeah, in the old one there. That whole area in there is opening up, and that would be. The way with the gym. Oh, there. Yeah, yeah that would be um, probably close to 80% of the vested revenue okay. today. Thank you. Um, okay, just again, getting back to our. Um, on page 55, it's just a comment, 55, 56, paragraph 37, where we talk about our um, <coughs> capital expenditure. Um, <coughs> we're eight months through the year, i.e. 66% through the year, but we've only completed 38% of our capex. And this is just a <coughs> beating the same old drum. Um, at our last report, which was as at the 31st of December, we were 30% through the year, and it only completed 27% of our capex. So we haven't improved, we haven't caught up at all. Um, and I'm concerned we've only got a third of a year left and we've got to get 62% of our CapEx done. And since December, we have actually fallen behind. Because in, if you said uh, <coughs> we were supposed to do 8.7 in January, we did 4.7. We were supposed to do 10.6, uh, sorry, beg your pardon, January, we were supposed to do 8.7, we did 4.7. February, we were supposed to do 10.8, we did 9.9. .9. So um, I guess you don't ask the accountant this, you ask the engineers. <laughs> but are, are, are we really going to get there? 
I can give you a couple of comparative numbers before we perhaps talk yep. to the engineers, and that's last year, where in the last four months we spent almost 50% of the um, amended uh, um, budget. What we're looking at this year is more like 55%, mm. um, but there's no doubt that historically the numbers have ramped up in the yep. second part of the year. There's so only four months left. Yeah. yeah. Okay. If, I can, so, if I can help too. Just one, one question on that. I just want to be clear. Is this a, on the ground, the work hasn't been done, or on the ground the work has been done, but we just haven't collected all the invoices um, and, and put them into our ledger? So is this, an, is this the paperwork hasn't been done, or is it the work hasn't been done? Uh, Gary, I couldn't give you that level of detail. It, uh, almost bound to be an element of contractual obligations that talk about when payments are made. Yeah. And it might differ slightly from the amount of work that's done. But by and large, if there's an invoice, it will be accrued and it will be included in the spend. Okay. Were you going to say something, David? I was just going to add that um, this is for this discussion. Um, that's why last time when we talked about it, it's really important mm. for us to yeah. move to that 36-month capital program so that we can actually have a look and put more focus on um, the the size of the projects that we're completing <coughs> and how well those projects are going as opposed to the month of the spend. But the problem with you, instead, I mean, this is more, you know, we're, we're looking at things, what, you, what you've done is you said, let's, let's make it bigger so that there's more, and I don't want to be disrespectful, but so that there's more room to hide. And that would concern me. I think it, I think um, absolutely not hide, but be agile in terms of the projects, because yeah. one of the things that we can see is that some things here are under <laughs> um, or under contract related topics that are causing causing issues. And so what we want to be able to do is have more flexibility to bring projects forward to be able to um, between that 36 month period, so that we can be more agile and, and um, get on with the stuff that we can control, as opposed to um, have that have that cut cut off rigid process to be able to bring projects forward from the um, next year's capital program. Okay, we'll see how that goes. Okay, uh, on paragraph 58, which is our risk and, risks and opportunities, um, I just look back at the last risks and opportunity report on the 31st of December. Um, costs we had uh, in the costs column, so in the operating costs co costs column, 31st of December, we were $1.9 million, $1 million in there. That's now dropped to $1.6 million. So have we improved? I'm sorry, Gary, I don't have the um, last month's I have. report. <laughs> um, but I could certainly do a line-by-line -line comparison if I had. Okay, I couldn't, yeah, I, I couldn't find where the differences were coming from. So if I can help, there was an amount in there for the write-down of the municipal pool, but that... Um, that shouldn't have been in the community, so that's been removed. So in this December, it was December. wrongly put in there, was so it? So 460,000, that's correct. Okay, thank you. And uh, in the on the same report, the capital expenditure uh, has dropped. From, so in December, it was 5.5 million. It's dropped 4.6 million in February. Because of these two credits? 1.7 million. Oh, okay. The, All new, right. yeah. the new items. The, so they're, they're, reduc reduce, they're, they're showing benefit in the capital program because they're savings that have been made in the, in the capital program. Oh, okay. All right. So they're okay. So we've so they're good news stories. So, okay. Yeah. So when what? Uh, okay. Who's here to talk about those? Is anyone? Oh, Andrew just walked in. <laughs> so what happened there? Have we been told about these? Perhaps I've. So we're talking about the contract savings on the Western, Far Western Interceptor of a million dollars and the contract savings on the new water mains at Rotokauri for 750000 Sorry for coming in a little bit late, so I might be out of, out of the picture in terms of the context, but those are um, genuine contract savings through uh, great um, um, uh, procurement models the team's delivered, um, good industry pricing, um, so those are legitimate savings to the council, and we've declared those um, um, as, as savings for council, okay. so won't, the money won't be spent. And the challenge I've got is there's still a little bit to go on those projects, so the number will move around ever so slightly, but um, we just wanted to do the right thing and just declare that savings as early as we could to the organisation. I have to say that since this um, report was finalised, 
Um, there are a couple of other projects that will be coming in with savings as well, and with an intention that those will be reported through to the next finance uh, meeting, but they'll be of a similar value uh, at least. So I, I have to say, in, overall, the projects are going really well and in good health. Well, that's very good. Um, Listen, that is okay. Just on uh, page 62, so this is our accounting uh, set of accounts, our statement of comprehensive revenue and expenses. I just note that admin costs are up by 22% from last year to date, so um, administration costs. So <clears throat> year to date it's 5.8.5 uh, million. At the same time last year it was 6.9 million. Any no, yeah. The detail behind that, or, or what we have here, is on page 64. It's um, in the notes to the, the revenue and expenditure, and, and it talks about internal revenue associated with capital expenditure, work programs. Mm -hmm. And um, the expectation is that as the capital expenditure program increases, that variance will reduce. That's a timing. It's a timing question. So hang on, we're talking about administration costs. So what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Well, essentially, um, when uh, costs associated with capital expenditure or, or staff costs, um, we will have an internal charge. Um, but you capital, I mean, costs associated with capital expenditure, you get you capitalise into the asset, don't you? That's right. If we haven't capitalised it yet. Oh. Yeah. It's, okay. it's an expense. So because our capital program's behind, we've got a whole lot of consultants fees and staff yep. time that's still showing as if it's an operating expense rather than a cost of the asset. Is that Correct. what you're saying? Okay. Thank you. Okay. I just wonder, um, no, I won't relitigate that again. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you. That's me done. Uh, Mark. The same questions I was going to ask, so I've got a couple left. So shut up then. No, here we go. <laughs> um, just regards the, uh, on page, mine actually all surround page 58 and 59, um, around the parks and open spaces, the river slips, that's, uh, I hope I'm asking the right person, or maybe the city manager might be able to help. Are we um, aware of how much we have or haven't budgeted for in the long-term plan with that? Are we putting enough for that? Because this seems to be a more often recurring thing, the river slips. I mean, at the moment. Uh, is it, is this I, the right forum to bring that up? Or? Yep, directly to Lance. Uh, my recollection in the draft LTP, there was discussion at a number of workshops about that, and should we have a, <laughs> yeah. um, a reserve of some, some amount and description? I think the outcome of that, if I remember correctly, was... Uh, we said that we would handle that how we have been through risks and opportunities because mm. um, how long is a piece of string with those? Um, and we didn't want to sort of jam jar our account and put money away for things that may or may not happen that probably will happen with river slips, unfortunately, with um, yeah. the history. But we, we don't know the figures, but we're really relying on something that, you know, Andrew Parsons was just talking about before is the, the upside. So if we get tenders coming in that, you know, we get good prices and we have some savings, then we'll use those to put towards river slips. So that was debated, my recollection, and I may have missed the final meeting, unfortunately, mm, mm, um, mm. was that uh, we we decided not to put that reserve amount aside, even though there was um, varying views around the table. OK, yeah, because I'm just sort of wondering if we couldn't get a, a bit more ahead of the spear check, or not for... Just a little bit more of information. Um, we found it quite challenging, engineering information, just with um, yeah, okay. uh, the the type of engineers that are needed and the amount of work that's going on around New Zealand. So uh, Maria's team have found that a little bit frustrating, okay. but um, we're, um, uh, we're in the process of seeing if we can get a wider pool of the type of engineers we need. Some of it's quite specialised work. Yeah. I've just got a feeling that might be something we need to keep an eye on, but probably that's for another discussion. Just, well, just, to, uh, just continuing on that, um, if I may, Lance. Um, so that... Any costs associated with that are not in our accounting figures. That's right. Yeah, they're risks and opportunities. And they're not in our... So the next thing we go to is risks and opportunities. 
and it's not in there. Mm. So to be quite clear, you know, there, there is no provision, and we're just yeah. being uh, being alerted. Look, this is on the horizon. Mm. It, something yeah, might happen. Yeah, something yeah. might not happen. So there is no recognition of any cost to the council or ratepayers in our reports thus far. Yeah. It's just being recorded as this is out there. We don't know, and like as Lance said, we just don't know. Yeah. Okay. So, all righty. No, thank you. No, I just want to highlight that. Um, the so the shared services on page fifty eight. The shared services water study. The two hundred thousand there. Well, that was the all up, or that was just the most recent spend on that. <coughs> I might be on a different page to you. I think. Oh no, I'm not. No, no, no. We're on the same page. Hmm. Um, my understanding is that is an estimated cost. Oh, okay. So. Okay. Um, no, that's yeah. all right. No, You're talking the 200,000? Yeah, yeah, because I asked a question about uh, how much we'd spend on that. Yeah, that was the estimation study. that came to council and was approved on the 21st of September, so 200,000. Okay. I don't know how much of that is left to be spent, but yep. um, that's that's the amount that council have approved. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, what was the contract savings on the Far Western Interceptor? That's a pretty significant one, eh? Uh, well, so... It was la that one's largely due to the um, to market pricing okay. uh, and the contractors program. So, um, and that's that's simply the savings against budget. Right. Um, the actual, as I said before, the actual value won't be determined until the work's completed. So it's still going to run for a few more months, and you know, it could we could have some unseasonal weather. We we might get a good run as well. But um, my best guess at this stage is a million dollars on the table savings for council and. We've we've simply declared it, so the organisation can cool can have that money. Thank you. And that um, by election that cost ninety thousand dollars. Geez, when you better be worth it. That's all. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> did you did you declare that in your expenses, mate? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you done, Mark? Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Ziggy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your. Look, um, just a couple of things. Stormwater Valley Terrace, and uh, I probably have to talk to Mario. Just what about. page are you on? Um, oh, sorry, um, it's 58. 58. Oh. That's Risk and Opportunities, line three. Yeah, that's right. Um, is That's hopefully not that much, or have we got any new, new news on that? Yeah. Or What we have is what's in the report, but it also okay. would have been what was approved. Yeah. So I would have to come back to council and have some different approval for yeah. exchange in there. And I, well, we'll see when we when it's done. Yeah. Uh, is there any any more report on that? Or? Um, I can't provide an update to that. No. Um, at this stage, it's um, progressing well. Although we're we're still at the um, confirming of access arrangements, but um, we believe that um, we won't spend that full value. But we just haven't quite worked out exactly how under we will be. Okay, so. cool. Thank you. Um, other question is, yeah, I, I love it when you save some money. Thank you so much, Andrew. That one million, um, it's good. On the storm, whatever, um, the, no, the Western Interceptor, that's cool. The other question I've got is um, on page 97. Um, it's under Transportation Network and it's the lead Lead Street Light re Renewals, and I know we're getting some money from government. Uh, how much do we get towards that, or is, is that right? I'll have to find it first. So <laughs> it's so um, I can. Uh, oh, oh yeah. I'm not exactly sure how much money we get from government. I think that Opposite. came back. To, yeah, there's a. Um, it was a percentage far rate of around. 80% approximately, okay. I can't be 100% um, sure on that. Um, so that will come through in terms of our um, financials as well. Just, I just wanted sort of a ballpark okay. figure, that's fine. Um, and the other one is page uh, 98, and that's um, under water supply. And I just wanted to, um, what was the $3,000 we spent on fluoride-free water source? Um, sorry, I'll just get Myri to answer that question because she would. Thank you. So as you're aware, there was a project last year to establish the, um, the fluoride-free water source and that was just some late costs that, that weren't captured in last year's financials that have 
in this financial year. Okay. So it's just an extension of, of the project that was completed last year. Okay. Was that the cost of the fluoride tablet she put into the... <laughs> no. Uh, oh, just well. a waste of money. But thank you so much. Thank you. That's all for me. Thank you, Sugi. Uh, Paula. Thank you, Chair. Just a couple of um, general questions. User charges, user fees and charges, you said there was some increase in those. I just wanted to know, oops, was, my page. was that a result of... Um, Can you give us a page number, Paula? Well, no, they're just general. But it re relates to the um, user charges being greater than you, more favourable than you thought they would be in the budget. And I just wanted to know if the, that was as a result of we did make some adjustment to fees and charges just recently. We put them up. And did the, is that part of it, or is that, are we seeing an actual an increase in those services and therefore bringing in more money through more demand rather than... Um, can, the, I don't know where I'd find that. but uh, If you have a look on page 64, there's a little bit of detail in there. Mm. Um, and that talks about the, the user charges from planning, cemeteries, parking and trade waste. Um, <coughs> what I can say is that's also consistent over the last few months. Mm. So we have been seeing a general trend. That would suggest to me that it is activity related as opposed to necessarily mm. the price. There yeah, if I, can, if I can help there, there Russell, um, you know, the fees and charges get set once a year through the annual plan process. So the ones yeah. that you've most, most recently seen would relate to the uh, first year of the long-term plan. So oh, okay. um, this would this would absolutely be uh, volume Activity. related, volume, not quantum. Oh, Correct. Quantum not not price. It'll not be price. volume. Price. Thank yeah. you. That's been said. <clears throat> um, and in terms of the deferrals on, well, there's a list on them, page 103. Yep. Um, I noticed that a number of those have been deferred because of the um, capacity of contractors to um, to do the work. And I just uh, want to ask a general question about could we expect that demand on contractors to continue? We're coming into a big growth phase. A lot of that core infrastructure will need to be, be built, notwithstanding we'll need um, carpenters to build houses as well. But a lot of things are already being delayed. Is there a, um, um, is there a, a, a supply and demand issue there? Is it, is it lack of contractors? Are they too busy? Have they got? Have they taken on much work, mm. or or what's going on there? Which so if I can, if I can just start off the in answering that, um, it's one of the things that we know is going to be an issue. Um, if you have a look at all the growth councils, they have a significant capital works program, um, which is one reason why we are looking at, uh, should we say, re restructuring how we go about delivering our capital program to make sure that we have um, streamlined processes and great, ten including great tender processes. Um, there's definitely, it's an unknown at the moment, um, given the nature and the size of the CAPEX programs, but um, mm. um, again, one of the reasons why we want to have a different way of, of delivering our capital program and reporting our capital program is to give us that agility to be able to say that if we can't get access to a supplier over these um, number of months, then we, let's just flip another capital project so that we can just keep going and um, delivering a, a, the intention of the capital plan. Mm. I'll support that, but um, there, there are still some risk in that. There definitely are risk, and there's definitely a challenge for us to be able to so attract. So uh, are we working with some of the key sectors? Like, I know that civil engineering is a shortage across the country for civil engineers, and trying to do something at skill level around that? And the whole, the whole capital le delivery leads are doing all of those things and more. Um, it's, so it's are we in conversation with the sectors to, give that, to get a realistic um, foresight around? I mean, I know the construction industry has been saying there won't be as many builders as you'd like, and government's trying to train them right now, today, sure. to train them. Sure. So, uh, you know, I'd just like to get some feedback at some stage yep. from the various sectors that we will want to engage to do these uh, important bits of work. So just that's Thank you. And one last question, if I may. Um, in terms of the deferrals, um, I found it hard to kind of um, understand if there were any implications of, of deferrals to the renewals and maintenance spend, because what's happened in the past is we've deferred some maintenance, either deliberately or unintentionally, mm. and you get a um, degraded asset that costs a little bit more, or, you know, so vis-a-vis the, -vis the library or the pools or the sector. So these are all capital deferrals? Yeah, these are all capital deferrals. I know they are, sorry, but where would I find... Um, any information around 
uh, work not getting done in the renewals and maintenance er mm. area of our business, um, keeping track of that because I think that is important. It's probably. Um, it can be provided at another so time. It's, it's a, it's a, so the, the, our renewals and maintenance program derivatives of our asset management plan. So as you know, we're getting better and better at doing that. And through the long-term plan, we have got more visibility of what needs to get done. Um, our capital program has stayed relatively constant, um, which does include renewals over the last few years, but we can see that it's ramping up next year. So um, there, is no, there are no, there are no, um, um, there are no uh, challenges that we've currently got in terms of getting, getting our maintenance and, and renewals done outside of um, the amount of money we've got to spend to, to be able to do that. Oh, well, that's a separate issue. <laughs> um, but mm. certainly moving into the first year of the long-term plan. Mm. I guess I want to know where I will get visibility, be able to track across time so that you don't get slippage. Yeah, so at a high level, you'd look uh, to the operating and maintenance costs in the p and mm. um, At the moment, that's showing a slight positive variance um, mm -hmm. against budget, Yeah. Um, which, again, it, it's at a very high level, but mm. that would be the first place um, if there was... Uh, either significant increases in, in costs coming through as a result of deferrals. Mm. Um, mm. Okay, so... Okay. And you'd also be able to talk to the general managers for both the community and um, H3 and, and, and Chris. Yes, I could, but then that only I know it then. I mean, I'm just wondering sure. what the, the formal um, If there was ever some issues in terms of deferring... Yeah. Is that where, where but where would yeah. I get the detail? You'd get it through community and so it would come through be, you, through me? Well, it's, it's page, it would show up on page 103 if it's a capital renewal. Yeah, I've got and if it, was, if it was behind or needs to be deferred, then it'll show up in this. So it field. would show here. Yeah. yeah. And also, um, the, the further detail would be in the section uh, called Attachment 2 which mm -hmm. gives each individual area. Yes, I did And you can there. see the spending and operating and maintenance cost in each, in each space. Okay, so, so it's important to keep a track of this list just in case a significant project is deferred and we and yes. are we going to incur greater costs going forward. Yes. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Uh, Ryan. Thank you, sir. Councillor Chair. Gary. Keep um, yeah, jokes. Oh, um, Russell, <laughs> um, Gary the Hammer. Um, on page 63, um, just referring to the, the our two balancing the books measures, just on the top one, the council one, um, I, I, I've no problem with the figure. We've looked at that earlier, but I'm just wondering, you know how we've got that uh, DC factor of that 35 or 65? Is that sitting in, in those gains lost, gains so, lost somewhere? So no, um, these two measures are current year, and the first one is the councils balancing the books, the second one called government. The number that you're talking or referring to is the 2018 Ford right. okay. planned approach. Okay. But your question, um, the development contributions which you can see on page 62, which is... Uh, See, there's a six beside it. It's 16,000. Well, those are million. Put, put three zeros on the figure that I say. There's 16,018. Mm. That has not been deducted from the surplus figure in the. So those are, those um, right. uh, those that revenue has been show is still included in that 22 uh, right. 26. In, in the top, uh, sorry, the 14 thousand dollar 14,730. Right. So, so in the in the top measure. Um, development and financial con contributions are included as in if the they are available for payment okay. day to day. So, expenses. this just goes back to the first point. So, this is the old council balancing the book measure, or, Correct. or current. Okay, I, I think going forward, it just needs clear identification like existing BB, LGNZ BB, new BB, whatever. It's just like this is where it creates a bit of, for me, the, certainly. The, the approach at the moment is that until the LTP is approved by council and uh, ratified, we do not report this report. So we are currently reporting the council's balancing the book measure, which is the, if you like, sure. 2015 to 18 LTP, yep. and the LG, which is the 
um, the government regulated. I, I appreciate but what you're saying. to help Brian, we're happy to put in brackets yeah. after the measure, the 2015 yep. measure. Well, I assume, thank you, I assume that other yep. members are going to be feeling the same thing. Yep. It's just... It's not, sure. it's not technically correct to call it the old one because it's the phone. It is the current, one. current, the current, current one. one. But, um, but, uh, but if we can, we can call it the 2015 measure yep. um, and the local government measure. Uh, we, we'll always only ever have two. Um, yep. It's just the transitioning for the re revised top uh, 2015 measure that's creating the confusion. But we'll put in brackets after that, the 2015 measure, and that, 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 that should, should hopefully come some way to... Yeah, thank you. We're, we're trying very hard to be consistent with terms because we understand the um, difficulty. Hallelujah. <laughs> You've seen the light. That's all. Okay, okay. that you, Ryan? Thank you. Uh, Leo? Yeah, I don't really know. But on page, uh, <laughs> page 91, under the transportation budget there, the, I noticed that the revenue from the on-street parking is 170000 for the eight months. For me, that's down to 21,000 a month. There's nothing here to compare it as to what we had before we had the two hours free. Mm. And I'm just wondering how much money we're hemorrhaging um, over this period. I would have to research that and get back yeah, to you. Yeah, I thought so, yeah. Because this here wouldn't even be paying the wages at 21,000 a month. Mm. Leo's got a good point. I've asked this before, and I've been told there's a report coming, there's a report coming, but it hasn't turned up. Quite told quite specifically okay, when, the when the report was coming, when which it? was to the next G committee meeting. You were told that the last one, and the date was given, and the report is coming. So, so when's that report coming? Next week at the GNI committee meeting. So we'll get that figure as, then. As per the promise last time. Right, thank you. There you go, Leo. Um, it's slightly better when, uh, than, than the original figures. Rob was today. Yeah. Okay, thank you. We'll see. Yeah. Well, we have seen. Okay. Those who came to the meeting. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the full council will get disclosure of that at your meeting next week, Dave. That's correct. Excellent. <laughs> In Hamilton, New Zealand. <laughs> Um, okay, there are no further questions. Okay, I'll move the staff recommendation, which is simply that we receive the report. James uh, Mallet Casson. Casson. <laughs> okay, uh, those in favour? Oh, sorry, is there any debate? Beg your pardon. Okay, those in favour, more importantly, those against, no one, so thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, Andrew, uh, Thomas is here. Do you mind if, uh, members, do you mind if we uh, shoot Thomas through? Which is the uh, vibrant Hamilton Trust. He has been waiting for quite some time and he gets paid absolutely nothing for doing it. So. <laughs> It, 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 it's all right if you, if you don't mind. Yeah. yeah okay. Thank you. So we are going on to uh, item 13, page 173, vibrant Hamilton Trust statement of intent and half yearly report. So it's another one of our CCO report. Thomas is the chairman of the trust. Thank you very much, Thomas. Thank you, Gary. Um, a special welcome to um, Councillor Hamilton. Um, and I hope you all had a, a good relaxing Easter. Um, for those who don't know me, Thomas Gibbons, uh, Chair of the Vibrant Hamilton Trust. So I gave a bit of a presentation about the Trust in December uh, last year. Very briefly, we're a charitable trust. Uh, we're a council-controlled organisation. Again, not one single. Sorry, Thomas. It's That's right. 173. Uh, I don't think it is. So we're all grasping for the page at the same time. Sure. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, we've got different agendas going around. I've got 173. Uh, so a replacement agenda was handed out, Mark, last week. So you may have, oh, an, you may have an earlier yeah, variation. Yeah, you may have an earlier version. <laughs> I 
That's Sorry, do other any other members have a, an agenda that doesn't have 173 being the Hamilton Vibrant Trust? Yes. Two more. So Paula needs one too. And Ryan. And Ryan. Sorry, Thomas. No, that's all right. It's always nice to be here. So. <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca. Go for it. Cover it in the questions. So just starting again, we're page 173, Hamilton Vibrant Trust. So I think I'd introduced myself and said we're a charitable trust and a council-controlled organisation, CEO. Um, our key purpose is to help fund projects that benefit the people of Hamilton. Uh, with an emphasis on projects. So since our establishment a few years ago, we've put um, funding into uh, the gardens, uh, Lake Waipakariki, laneway murals, and various other things. Uh, we work to grow our fund, so we started off with about 4.6 million, uh, and that's grown to over 6 million, while maintaining uh, a steady level of grants. Um, trustees essentially serve at the um, pleasure of council. That's the CCO nature, so it is a um, privilege to serve. Uh, we are seeking council's approval to the draft statement of intent. Uh, this is required as we're a council-controlled organisation, so we map out uh, what we want to do this year. Uh, we send it to council and ask for council's approval. It's, it's very similar to prior years, and... Uh, Really, that's probably all I wanted to cover. I'm happy to take questions, and, and thanks for the time. Thank you, Thomas. Um, just on... OK, so, councillors, this is page 175 in your agendas. I don't know if Thomas... I don't have, have a numbered page, but... OK, you, it, it's actually your statement top. of accounts. It's your... Um, that one there. Can you see that from where you are? I don't have the full detail, but sing out and I'll okay. try to do it, my okay. best. OK, I was just, ringing, uh, just wanting to comment that uh, the trust equity is up by, uh, by half a million dollars, which is a 10% increase from the last 12 months. Yes. OK. Uh, and that's after paying $200,000 worth of grants. Sorry, I'll let you get up. Yeah, which exact column are you in, Gary? Uh, so the $200,000 worth of grants is in your actual 2018 six months. Yes. Uh, and uh, paying six months worth of fees and audit management fees and all that sort of stuff. Yes. So that's, okay, so that's a commendable effort. Thank you very much. I just wanted to <laughs> oh, no, highlight. No, I wasn't trying to catch you out or anything. No, no, that's all right. Yeah, well, that's I mean, coming. <laughs> it's, so the, the, the way we divide our funds up, just so people understand, is we have uh, around about 45% in fixed, um, fixed interest investments and 55% um, in growth investments, so effectively overseas shares and stocks. Um, they have been going pretty well um, for the last few years. They always, being growth stocks, have an element of up and down about them, mm -hmm. but uh, we take advice and, and set the mandate and... Uh, leave the fund manager to do that while, while overseeing. Thank you. And uh, so that $200,000 uh, grant is your six, only a six-month figure, is that right? Correct, yeah. Uh, you're expecting to pay another 100000 that's your budget, out by the end of the... We've, we've budgeted, yes. That's right. And in the next year's statement of intent is that you'll keep the grants at the same level? Yes, so yes. We've, we came up with that a few years ago, basically yep. as a mechanism of smoothing out uh, increases or decreases in stock market returns. Okay, thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Uh, Rob. Yeah, thanks, Chair. And thanks, Thomas. Um, perhaps if I could just record um, my thanks to you and your fellow trustees. Yes. You guys do a magnificent job in terms of... Mm -hmm. And the investment of those funds and the returns that we've been getting in, in recent years. Um, I, I noticed uh, in doing a quick analysis of the reports um, that you started off with, <coughs> excuse me, 4.12 million when the trust was set up, and now it's up to 6.152. Um, it would be quite interesting to know what the distributions have been since 2012. Um, I was able to work out that obviously there's there's been, I think, 500,000 in the last two years. 
Mm. Um, but it would be quite useful, perhaps in future reports, if you did list things. those, because obviously those distributions affect the funds that you've got to reinvest mm. and grow the fund. Mm. And so it would be quite good from a, uh, from a um, I guess, from a... Um, uh, a growth perspective just to see how much the fund has grown by and what it might have been had those distributions not been made. And I'm not suggesting that we don't do distributions going forward, but it, it is a good way of measuring um, the performance of the, of the trust. Sure. And, and I can understand you'd also want to know what the distributions are going towards. So, um, yeah, no, that's, that's understood. And I think um, we'll arrange for that to... Well, yep. try to arrange that to come through in the next report. So, so, but don't we have a say in where the money goes, or, or is that...? Essentially, you do um, indirectly, I suppose, okay, as a okay. CCO. So the trustees have to make um, a decision in accordance with the trust deed. Yep. yep. Um, and um, we, we engage very well with council about that. Um, and <laughs> otherwise, um, if... if uh, the trustees were getting things completely off base from council's point of view, then there's an ability to change the trustees right. uh, under right. the trust deed. But again, yeah, the decision on, on particular distributions rests with the trustees. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Are there no... Oh, uh, Martin. <clears throat> yeah, just obviously emphasise everything that said, but thank, pass on to your colleagues our thanks uh, for, for excellent work and, and um, stewardship of the fund. No, that's appreciated. I should mention who the other trustees are for those who don't know, and that's uh, Mayor King, uh, Lance Vervoort, who was over there before, uh, Malcolm Brooker, and Lynette Flowers. And myself. No, thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, <clears throat> if there's no more questions, I'll move the report. Uh, Gall Mallet, Gallagher, any debate? Okay, uh, we'll just do it by the voices again. Those in favour, those against. Are there any against? Okay, the report has been received and the draft's statement of intent has been approved unanimously. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You very much, Thomas. Yes. <clears throat> I'm sorry to be there, but just an advice, and it's not an embarrassment. Does Andrew have to be not counted in that vote, given he's actually on the trust itself, or this one doesn't matter? Okay, thank you. Tr uh, I was going to say, trustees, colleagues, can we um, snaffle... Gavin through. This is the lass. He's here now. Thank you very much for your patience and your lack of food. <laughs> uh, so we're moving on to local authority shared services, 14, page 189. Although I'm not too sure. Oh, you've all got the new. You've all got new um, agendas now, haven't you? Okay, so Gavin Irons, right. who is the chairman of LASS and... Yeah. Assisted by um, Blair. Blair, yep. yeah. So, um, Mr Chair, thanks very much for, uh, for giving me the opportunity to come along and talk a bit about LASS. So I guess, um, do you wish to deal with the six-month report first or deal with the um, statement of intent first? Do the six-month report first. So in terms of the six-month report... Um, the financial information um, is showing that we're ahead of budget, but largely it's due to timing differences. Um, there have been some additional work requested, um, which has been supported by additional contributions from the shareholders. Um, so we have additional revenue, we have additional cost, and, and particularly in relation to the um, RATA project. Um, Mr Chair, in terms of the non-financial measures, um, we're... Again, pretty much on track. A number have been achieved. Uh, a number are on track. There have been two that haven't been achieved. One was a report was due by the end of uh, December that was um, finished and completed by the end of January. And the other one is in relation to an update on the benefits arising from LAS through um, collaboration and action. And again, that's due to be completed very, very soon. So um, we'll have that um, for you to, to digest in due course, Mr Chair. Um, just happy to take any questions on that report. Thanks, Gavin. Um, on page 194, under a heading Energy Management, yep. it talks about there being some audits proposed, but the councils have not have decided not to proceed. Can you just um, do you know? Do you know? Does that ring a bell for you? <laughs> if it doesn't ring a bell, it's no point asking. You. 
Um, I, look, I don't know the specifics okay. of it. I mean, we, um, through you, Mr Chair, uh, Les signed up to, um, to do some work with ECA, got some subsidies. Yep. Um, that required some energy audits to be undertaken. Um, and look, I don't know the specifics of why those two weren't undertaken. Um, okay. So, so I can just add to that, yeah. uh, Chair. Um, Hamilton City Council is obviously a minor part of that particular initiative because we've already been extensively involved in the energy audits separately. Okay. So it was really off the back of Hamilton's work that, that LAS became involved in, in, and effectively the, the service was offered to all the councils in LAS. So some councils have chosen to take it up, some haven't. Hamilton has always been doing that work and has been progressing that for some years. So um, if the question is, is Hamilton doing that? Absolutely we are. Mm -hmm. we've, we've done that for many, many years with substantial success. This is in regard to all the other councils in last taking advantage of that particular Do we scheme. still have that, and I can't remember his name? The Martin Lynch? Yeah, the little yes, fellow. He is. He's, he's, he's the person. He's is he still here, is he? Yes, he is. All right. yeah, thank you. Thanks, uh, Flair. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, Dave. Yes, I want to ask uh, Gavin if he thought there was room under the shared service umbrella for uh, joint water operations and wastewater <laughs> operations. <laughs> oh, I beat you to it. Sorry. Oh. An asset owning one. No, no, no. With no. water meters you and everything like that. You can ask your own question about that. Um, I'm not quite sure how to answer this one, Chair. Yeah, I might, I might need to. Um, Seek help. Yeah. Uh, just have a brain. Just there, have a brain there is, uh, look, there is always opportunities for shared service arrangements. Um, I'm being very diplomatic here. You could be a um, politician. I could be, couldn't I? Um, I guess it depends on whether the parties are willing to be involved in, in, um, in a shared service arrangement on that basis. If you recall, if we go back in time, when we started, there were... There were all the councils were involved in looking at the early stages and then very quickly it came down to the willingness of, of the three key players, Waipa, Hamilton City and ourselves. And obviously we know what's happened arising from that, Mr Chair. So. I'll watch that space. You're going to keep prodding? No, no. no. OK. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ziggy. Thank you for that presentation. Can I just talk about the just before, or ECAL? And um, it says, and my, maybe I got that wrong here, but um, formal audits have been proposed, but the respective councils have decided not to proceed. And I just wondered why not? Because it looks like there would be more savings or not really? Um, so, so, so Ziggy, I mean, and sorry, I, I, I'm support Gavin because I'm also a director on the board. Um, from a board perspective, it would seem a logical area for them to, to undertake an audit because I, certainly in our experience the returns significantly exceed the investment. Yeah. But some of the councils may have other priorities, may, may not have their available resources, uh, maybe competing with other things, other initiatives. So, so we can only provide the opportunities for the councils, they have to be willing okay. to take it up. Okay, thank you. That's it. Uh, thanks, Siggy. Rob? Yeah, thank you. And I'll try to be very diplomatic with uh, the way I ask. <laughs> Uh, since Gavin is a guest here today. Um, look, I've always seen LAS as a great opportunity for, for the councils in the region to collaborate. Are you seeing as, as chair um, a greater, uh, uh, no, should I say, uh, are you seeing um, an appetite amongst more councils in the group to, to, to collaborate? Through you, Mr Chair, um, my answer would be yes. Um, it's not universal. And, and one of the challenges we face is that some of our members are also involved with BOP less as well. Sorry, with? With um, Bay of Plenty less. Oh, okay, okay. okay. Yep. Um, yep. So, and that's the like of Taupo, uh, South Waikato, and Rotorua as well. So, um, so sometimes there are initiatives which BOP less are undertaking, which um, the, some of those councils are already involved in and therefore they've chosen to stay with BOPLAS. What we are doing is looking um, as part of our strategic review at what the options are. Um, one of our concerns is that we don't have enough scale and thinking about the opportunities in terms of uh, getting a closer arrangement, maybe one company with BOPLAS, and therefore giving ourselves more scale and, and more opportunities. Uh, and we're having initial discussions on Thursday. 
Good, so. good, okay. And would you say as, as chair, do you think Hamilton City Council is one of those councils in the last group who does have um, a positive attitude to want to collaborate? Yes. So um, through you, Mr Chair, look, the, the reality is a lot of the initiatives are undertaken again around those three core councils, WIPAR ourselves, Hamilton City, um, and then and then a lot of the others come in on, on a lot of the initiatives that are being undertaken. But Hamilton City is very much a core player in most of our activities, if not all our activities. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Martin? I'll probably mine a more understatement of intent. Are you, are you dividing this into Yeah, two we're doing parts? them both together. Yep. Are you doing both yep. together? Yeah, well, I suppose um, more to Blair, because obviously this council I'm anticipating is going to have a major discussion uh, around our participation. And my personal views, I'm a strong believer in Waikato plan, but obviously this council is going to have a pretty major con you know, discussion. And, and uh, I guess what we're looking for is where we have achieved runs on the board in return for, for money, and where should we not waste our time? And I have to say, obviously, the totally understand Waikato looks to Auckland. I, I kind of get that. Uh, but I think the WIPA decision uh, is intriguing. So I'm not sure what the question there is. Well, the question is that uh, Nanaima, who to her various, the Minister of Local Government says, well, basically central government is going to do it yep. probably for us. And I'm just trying to get the balance between um, the, what we have achieved, but I think it's also important what, mm. what we haven't achieved. So what I'm looking at is, is return for investment. So this, I think it's not blaming... So I think, Martin, yeah. maybe, maybe if I answer it this way, sure. um, the, the, the role of the LAS company mm. is complementary to the other initiatives that we have right. where, where right. as a regional or sub-region yeah. we, we collaborate yeah. and work together. So the LAS entity is about areas where we can join up the delivery of services or activities to, to either deliver um, those at lower cost mm. and a more customer-friendly mm. way with lower risk profiles, uh, or certainly just, just in some instances, provide the, um, the resourcing for com complexity. Mm. And I think the company has done that very well, but, but as Gavin has said, as we look to the future, we believe there are substantial opportunities that we haven't yet tapped into, and I'll, I'll let Gavin s speak to what we're thinking there, but certainly we believe there's a, there's a next, next stage and the maturity stage for the company. L less complements the likes of Future Proof, the Mural Forum yes. and the Waikato Plan mm. in a very mutually beneficial way. Mm. So the Waikato mm. Plan is about how we speak with one voice with the government and key stakeholders mm. as the Waikato, and I think that's really important. And that's quite different from LAS. LAS is a vehicle upon which we, we, we commercially undertake activities, but the Waikato Plan is how we speak with one sure. voice. Um, the Mural Forum is a chance for the mayors to come together to provide some joint leadership from a council perspective which then helps inform the likes of the, the mm. LAS company initiatives or the wake of so, so that they are very much complementary in how they operate, Martin. Yeah, the Bay of Plenty, I just mentioned looking forward, you, 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 this is quite critical, I would have assumed, is that, you know, Bay of Plenty, Waikato, what areas would be potentially... We haven't had any substanti substantive discussions mm. about that yet, and that's really what Thursday is about. Mm. First of all, we want to assess the, the appetite of the Bay of Plenty to, mm. to look wider. Um, but but when we some of the work we've done indicates that it would require um, more investment because we don't have we don't have many resources. We need more resources to really achieve a lot more. If we're going to achieve a lot more, we feel we need more scale. Um, and more scale and more contributions from, from more councils, and then we could achieve a lot more. So that's really the, the basis of our conversation. We haven't got into, spe into specifics. Um, you know, there are other less operations around the country that are um, looking at um, archival facilities and things like that. Um, and, you know, some of those opportunities, uh, again, would be things that we might look at in the course of time as well. But we want to be able to know, first of all, whether there is, at the moment we feel there's a lot of common ground with, um, with BOPLAS. Um, you know, we, we are involved in, in some, some sort of complementary activities already uh, and just feel there's 
It's a very good place to start, but, but again, we may need to look wider than that to really get the benefits. Just to, so to support Gavin there, Martin, um, one of the things that we find is that you often need scale to make any joint up initiatives happen. And so mm -hmm. Gavin talked about the councils in the Waikato who have the scale. Um, if you look to the Bay of Plenty, it would be Tauranga and Western Bay of Plenty, the two councils there, plus yeah. the regional council yeah. and the regional council here. So what's common between those two areas is growth, and particularly mm. high growth, the high growth areas. Yeah. So if we start to think of that lens around collaboration opportunities, there may be everything from um, some of our support service functions, you know, IT in particular, information services. So um, certainly something that, that, that David is championing um, on behalf of the Waikato Lass is, is our sort of our digital future and opportunities for us to collaborate in IT, GIS, information systems. And if you start to look across to Tauranga and Bay of Plenty, they've got the same challenges. So again, if you start to look at these initiatives with the bigger councils, it's easier to potentially get the critical mass to, 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 to move forward than potentially to ask some of our smaller councils to be on day one an early adopter. It's very hard for a small council to say, we have the money you're prepared to, 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 to back this particular um, opportunity. Whereas, I, uh, say, a Waikato district, ourselves, Waikato, Western Bay and, and Tauranga I might say, actually, we need to, we need to have a, a new single rating system or a, a new financial system, and potentially the critical mass there is to make those opportunities happen. So that's where we see across the, the two council areas. We're, we're united with our challenges of growth. We're united with the need to deliver services, uh, higher services at, at lower cost. Um, the, the opportunities for the smaller councils, such as the Hopis and, and sorry, the Potakis, the Fokotanis, the Waitangas, the Ochoongas are always going to be there, but they won't be the early adopters. They'll be more likely to be off the back of the initiative that the bigger councils take. And, and without telling you how to write a future report, obviously we are going to be, this council is going to do some analysis around the regional thing, and I think it's really crucial that you, with respect, remind this council what LAS has achieved, because obviously we're going to be debating how much we have spent on the Waters Initiative, and by one vote in another town it went down the tube, uh, and, and this is, it is as it is, but there's a mood in this council just to ensure that any dollar we spend on regional initiative ultimately is a return. So obviously we never want to go on a waters journey again, the type of journey, future proof, fantastic. You know, this, it's, all I'm saying to you, Blair, is I think it's going to be really helpful that you in that report when we do the, the you know, when we look at what is the Waikato plan costing us, what do we get from it, what did the Waik the waters uh, journey cost us for apparently zero, maybe, and then this. I just would stress it's going to be really important that we get reminded of what LAS has achieved, and also, most importantly, that great potential in terms of a hookup with the high growth councils across the climb lines. So just to close on that, Martin, yeah. Gavin talked about the collaboration and action yeah. report. Yeah. That, that report for LAS will summarise mm. the, the achievements of the last right. um, period of time. Mm. Um, in, in, a, in a simple um, summary, LAS has achieved a huge amount. The bang for buck is absolute, and the return on investment is significant mm. across a range of a range of initiatives. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. There's no other names down there. I will. Um, <clears throat> I'll remove. I will move the recommendation on page 189. Uh, Mallet Gallagher, I think. What did your hand go up, Martin? Yep, Mallet Gallagher. Okay. Those in favour. Those against. Is there anyone against? Okay, that's unanimous. Um, thank you. We will now uh, break until is two o'clock. All right, thirty-five minutes. Okay, for lunch. Anyone want any? Andrew doesn't eat as much. He's, he's a vegan. <laughs> There's so little for him to eat out there. <laughs> okay, so if we can be back by two o'clock, that'd be great. Thank you. We've only got. Uh, one more public thing to do.